Good evening. Uh, I'll first await a motion to leave the non-public and to seal the minutes. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, and good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight, Tuesday, June 20th, City Council meeting. Kelly, whenever you are ready, <laughs> please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor McCachran? Here. Assistant Mayor Kelly? Here. Councilor Tabor? Here. Councilor Denton? Here. Councilor Moreau? Here. Councilor Bagley? Here. Councilor Lombardi? Here. Council Blaylock? Here. Council Cook? Here. Uh, and before we stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, I would just like to uh, thank the New Hampshire uh, Black Heritage Trail for a weekend of fantastic events celebrating Juneteenth. It was a uh, a uplifting experience um, of reflection, but also celebration, uh, and would hope that we all keep the uh, that thought in our head uh, as we as we move forward to make a better country. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have a proclamation to read on the Golden Rule. I believe it's Peter Somsich here. Peter is unable to be here. Excellent. Whereas the Golden Rule, a sailing ambassador for the message of ending the threat of nuclear war, visits Portsmouth June 21st to June 25th, 2023. And whereas July 2017, 122 nations approved the Treaty of the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which makes it illegal under international law to develop, test, produce, manufacture, or otherwise acquire, possess, or stockpile nuclear weapons or other nuclear explosive devices. And whereas back from the brink, a U.S. grassroots coalition of individuals organizations and elected officials in more than 80 municipalities working together towards a world free of nuclear weapons and is advocating for common sense nuclear weapons policies to secure a safer, more just future and calling on the United States to lead a global effort to prevent nuclear war. And whereas there is serious and ongoing risk that the world tensions could escalate to the level of nuclear conflict. And whereas in 1958, the Golden Rule sailed from California towards the Marshall Islands in attempt to stop nuclear bomb tests in the Pacific and subsequent arrests of five Golden Rule crew members prompted worldwide protest and helped touched off a movement which led to the adoption of the Partial Test Ban Treaty. And whereas the Golden Rule was recovered and rehabilitated by Veterans for Peace and is once again educating communities across the United States about the nuclear danger and the need for worldwide elimination of nuclear weapons. And whereas on the occasion of the city's 400th anniversary, we recall the historic role Portsmouth played in citizen diplomacy that ended the Russo-Japanese War with the Portsmouth Peace Treaty in 1905. And whereas mayor of Portsmouth, I joined my predecessors and mayors of 337 cities and three countries as members of the Mayors for Peace initiatives. Now, therefore, I, Daglin McCachran, mayor of the city of Portsmouth, on behalf of the members of the city council and citizens of Portsmouth, do hereby proclaim June 22, 2023, Golden Rule Day in Portsmouth and extend a warm welcome to the Golden Rule and its crew, wishing them not only safe and successful journeys. Given with my hand and the seal of the city of Portsmouth on this 20th day of June, 2023. Would you like to come receive it? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And everyone is welcome to come to Prescott Park from 11 to 3 on Thursday, Friday, Next up, the acceptance of minutes, uh, May 1st, uh, 2023. I'd wait a motion to accept and approve the minutes of the May 1st, 2023 City Council meeting. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Up to public comment. Um, I see that there is, well, there's a, there's a lot on Sherburne. There's one on Johnny Cash. Look forward to uh, that one. Um, I just want to state, I know that we have a presentation later in the evening. Um, there's not any action that's taken tonight. So anything 
after we listen to the report, any action that will be taken uh, will be taken at the next city council meeting. But I encourage everybody to come up uh, and speak your mind for three minutes. We're going to digest what we hear today in terms of public comment, but also in terms of presentation. And anything that would be taken in terms of action will occur uh, if there is the next city council meeting. So um, up first is Ruben uh, Izigira uh, on the topic of Sherburn School. And sorry, Ruben, did I get your last name right? Okay. Close enough. Close enough. All right. All right. Thank you. Uh, I started my opposition to Ruben, this project. Sorry, this can you just state your name? And, uh, and This is Ruben Izagiri. I live on Colonial Drive in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. I'm speaking about the Sherburn School. I started my opposition to this project based on the notion that adding this housing project would ne negatively affect the character of the community, the traffic experience in our neighborhood, and the removal of the girls' softball field with no real plan on how and where to replace it. Through my research over several months, I have uncovered a much more disturbing and harmful process to this project that the residents of Panaway Manor and this city as a whole are being subject to. It is very clear that the mayor has promised the land to Sherburn School and the PHA behind closed doors without consulting any residents. The mayor has also asked them to spend money on drawing up some plans for the site, which the PHA gladly did as it benefits them greatly to acquire this land. And they promptly placed as many housing units as possible into that space. They presented this haphazard and half-baked plan and tried to sell it to the residents of Panaway Manor to near record unanimous opposition. The council then retreated to its lair, regrouped, and attempted to fool the residents of Panaway Manor by pretending to listen to their concerns, all while obviously still planning to go through with this project and giving us a dog and pony show to appease our anxieties through the consultation of the Land Use Committee and possible other sites. It is an exercise in futility to get this council to do its job and listen to its constituents. Why would the council do this? Why would they go against the will of their constituents when it's so blatantly obvious that they don't want this project? The short answer is money, and lots of it. The Portsmouth Housing Authority uses their moniker and people's mistaken connotation that they are a city-run entity that financially benefits the city. This confusion obfuscates the fact that the PHA is actually independent of the city and basically a private run developer with anonymous private investors who we can assume require ample rates of return on their investments. The city gets zero return on its investment. The, PHA pri the PHA's primary grift is to get as much city-owned land for free as their portfolio, in their portfolio as they can and develop it and pay their investors and Mr. Welch's generous salary. They are using this current city council as a vehicle to do that. The PHA is just a developer like any other with one major advantage. They can get a foolish or morally flexible city council to give them prime city-owned land for free under the guise of altruism. The PHA and Mr. Welch will always act in their best interests, not in the interests of the members of the community as PHA pays Mr. Welch's handsome salary and the rate of return for his investors. This should anger every resident of the city. Who are these investors and how much are they getting paid? If the PHA had their way, as expressed in the past, they would build the city out of every piece of land they can get their hands on and develop it. It is an egregious conflict of interest for the city to allow Mr. Welch any say in this, much less be on the land use committee. This, atten this addition, in addition to the moral hazard of having three city council members on that same committee as well who decide the fate of this land. Why does the council keep ignoring these conflict of interest issues? I have several questions to ask close? the City Council and the residents of Portsmouth deserve to have answered. The demand for housing in Portsmouth is basically unlimited. City-owned property is not. Has this site been analyzed for the new police station or ice rink? Where is the RFP for development that Mr. Chelman and the Land Use Committee asked for? Why is the PHA the only organization that was considered 
are no big contracts that give land away for free to private organizations in the best interest of this city? Who are these private investors and the PHA? Who and what rate of return are they asking? Any analysis done by the PHA is tainted by a serious <laughs> conflict of interest and should be thrown out with prejudice. We demand an outside impartial analysis of both the PHA and city-owned properties. Why is there such opposition from the council to this? The council still has not formally recognized a petition that I got signed by hundreds of registered voters opposing Ruben, this project Ruben, and Ruben, has still not are, answered are the numerous close? questions are we, that are our we community. Close? We're very close. Thank you. The hubris of this council to go against the near unanimous opposition of this project after we have seen their incredibly weak business acumen during the McIntyre debacle is frankly nauseating. This council has laid derelict their duty to represent the will of its constituents and has let the best interests of a private developer that masquerades as a city entity dictate their actions. Thank you. Next up, uh, Brandy Kramer on the topic of the Sherburn School. Hi, I'm Brandy Kramer. I live at 584 Colonial Drive. Um, I kind of thought we were going to hear maybe from you guys and then speak, so I feel a little awkward, like, oh, maybe you'll answer my questions. But now I'm here. Um, so I guess I'm just wondering if you guys could elaborate on to the plan for the Sherburn School and how it's going to affect the school system, the um, police department, the fire department, the one, ray, one road access. I'm, I haven't heard anything about like what is the plan? And I just like to kind of get some more information and I think a lot of us would. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Brandy. So um, this isn't a dialogue and I understand that if it's awkward not being a dialogue, um, there's not a plan yet. Uh, we'll hear a presentation this evening. Uh, from there, we will create a path forward if we do go forward with citizen input to create the plan. Um, next up is Peter Jones on the topic of the Sherburn School. Mr. Mayor, Councilors, Pete Jones, Greenland Road, Portsmouth. And I'm here to talk about uh, Sherburn property, specifically conflict of interest taking place there. So to this point, there have been three main organizations playing a key role in the Sherburn property. You all, the City Council, uh, the Portsmouth Land Use Committee, and then a private developer, the PHA. So it's important for everyone to know, as Ruben pointed out, that the Executive Director of the PHA, uh, Craig Welch at the moment, is in a position that's appointed by the Mayor. Um, so the same Craig Welch is also a member of our Portsmouth uh, Land Use Committee, which influences what we do with the city-owned land that we have. So in the case of the Sherburn School and the property there, the executive director of the only development firm in consideration was allowed to vote for the city of Portsmouth to gift that property to his organization, which is obviously and directly a conflict of interest. Um, taking that a step further, again, another point, these will probably be repeated tonight, um, were there any other additional developers considered by the council for this particular project? And based on previous comments and conversations from you all, uh, you didn't put out an RFP and there were no additional developers considered. So what gives? As residents, we're left asking ourselves, how could the city council truly believe that this would either go unnoticed or that we would support such collusive behavior? To many on the outside looking in, it looks as though the City Council are, and the PHA are attempting to make a backroom deal for their own personal, financial, and political benefit at the expense of the very residents who voted you into those seats. It looks as though the Council promised the Sherburn property to the PHA from day one, didn't anticipate the backlash from the community, and has been scrambling ever since to push a deal through based on your own personal timelines and agendas. This blatant conflict of interest 
along with the lack of process and transparency, have us all deeply concerned, as we hope you can understand. So we're asking you, please slow the process down. Let's start over from the beginning and do it the right way by working together. Thank you. Next up, Peter Officer. We're becoming old friends at this point. Uh, Peter Officer, Colonial Drive, Portsmouth. I'm here to call into question the process, if we can call it that, for how the Sherburne School was selected for this development. How did we get here? Back in January, you all received the presentation that the PHA delivered to you at the mayor's request. Hopefully, tonight will be quite different from the original, but the only change I am expecting is the presenter. Despite the amount of pushback from the public, this project has seemed to be full steam ahead while playing political charades with the public. How is it that a mayor can act independently to make the request of a private developer to build on public land for private gain? The PHA is a two-part organization. Only one side is nonprofit. It's also important to note they are not beholden to the city, despite its unique ties with mayoral appointments, but beholden to investors. How is it that the executive director, that an executive director of a private developer can sit on the city's land use committee and not recuse himself on a vote that could result in a deal that would afford his firm's investors 80% of the tax breaks if this deal were to go through? If there was no collusion, how is it that Sherburn is the number one property when there were no unbiased professional investigations into the final four properties? The Sherburne School property is the only option that is located in the Highway Noise Overlay District. Therefore, this project will require noise abatement, such as a sound barrier that costs hundreds of thousands of dollars, and approved from the state or potentially the Fed. The Sherburne School property is also the only option that has groundwater monitoring wells. Are these wells monitoring contaminated groundwater or monitoring a contaminated groundwater plume from a release at Pease? The Sherburne School is located between three wells, the Smith Well at Pease, the Collins Well, and the Portsmouth Well at Griffin Road. Does this property have any on-site contamination that could present a health hazard to future residents? Did you check? The Sherburn School property is, is the only option with an active recreation facility, a softball field that takes up two acres of land. Since the city has promised there will be no loss of recreation fields, and there is no other land for a softball field in Portsmouth, Despite the millions of dollars of monopoly money uh, that Councillor Blaylock has promised for a new field, this field will need to stay. This makes the amount of land available for a housing project to be three acres. Access to the site is via Route 1, by the, the Route 1 bypass, Borthwick Ave, or Route 33. Will the additional traffic generated by this project require an intersection improvement to increase capacity? What will these potential improvements cost? Have you taken into consideration that Liberty Mutual mandated a return to office in September for all of its employees? and that the Dover campuses of Liberty are going to be permanently closed, which means every single Liberty Mutual employee that lives within a 50-mile radius will be reporting to that Portsmouth office on Borthwick. A lot of what I just went through is why I believe every non-council or PHA representative that was on the Land Use Committee advocated for an independent evaluation of all city-owned property by an unbiased third party so that each property could be assigned its best public use. Could it be used for housing? Maybe. Recreation, obviously. Parks, police station, indoor sports complex, it goes on. I'm here to plead with you guys, like I have been, to please listen to your constituents and committee members, half of the land use committee. Jeez, guys, be our voice and do more than ask questions like you did last time. Make motions so that we can get the answers that we need. I appreciate the back and forth but don't be bullied by the mayor. Make motions. Help us. Denton, you tried. Make a motion. Guys, this is wrong. Do better. This is absolutely wrong. Thank you, Process Peter. is flawed. So disappointed in all of you. Next up, Manny Garganta. On the topic of the Sherburn. Well, we, we do have Johnny Cash coming up. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Mayor, uh, City Manager, Councilors. My name is Manuel Garganta. I live at 471 Colonial Drive. Uh, here we go again. I'm living the Groundhog Day all over again. We keep bringing up Sherburn School, Robert Lister Academy. It's a continuing saga. I have attended the Land Use Board 
I had meetings, <clears throat> excuse me, to listen to the discussions about the available properties that were suited for workforce housing. They prepared a list narrowing it down to four. They were tasked and completed what they were supposed to do. Of those four, Sherman School was number one. Surprise, <laughs> that was the only one that had the land that they needed. The board accomplished that task. One, I think, was left off, the old skateboard park, when we get our multi-million dollar skateboard park over the stump dump. Everybody tells me, well, there's deed restrictions. I think we've gone around those in different parts of the city. That is an ideal location. It's right next door to uh, Mr. Welch's uh, warm set place. He could take care of both places. Being totally realistic, there was no surprise in Sherman School. I've been asked why the residents are so protective of our neighborhood and school. My answer is, I feel we are the last true neighborhood of Portsmouth. We were the hidden gem. Nobody really knew we were out there. We had a close-knit community, blue-collar, multi-generational neighborhood. We have people here that have lived there all their lives. Their children went to the school at Sherman, grew up, got married, moved and moved back here, and raised their children, their kids. Why do we have to develop every open green space that's available in Portsmouth? We are now surrounded by Pease International Trade Port one, on one side, which I do not have a problem with. Being a veteran, they are the economic engine of Portsmouth. Borthwick Avenue is a densely developed industrial complex quoted in Seacoast Online. The development at the bottom of Borthwick Park, West End Yards, we have a new uh, proposal for, uh, <coughs> excuse me, a hotel where Port City is. Where is all this traffic going to go? Port Wick. It's a cut through. PHA has said they've done a traffic study. Surprise, I've never seen a traffic counter. I've never seen anybody sitting in cars unless we're doing it by satellite today. They said that there was going to be nine additional trips in the morning and 42 trips in the afternoon during peak hours. I do nine trips a day myself coming in and out of there. Has anybody sat there early in the morning and late in the evening when this traffic is coming in and out of Borthwick, coming out of Pease? When was this study done? Was it done during peak hours? Was it done during the pandemic? If we have to develop, <coughs> just do the 15 units inside Sherman School. You still get to keep your ballpark. You have green space. You don't have to spend $3 million to find new ballparks in the city. This is another subject for another day. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Next up is Jackie Kelly Pitts on the topic of the Sherburn. Thank you for letting me speak, Jackie Kelly Pitts, 40 Bedford Way. And for up front, I could not be in Portsmouth or live in Portsmouth unless I lived in PHA housing, which is senior housing. So that's full disclosure. And I thank God for it. And I know we need affordable housing. First, we need a definition of affordable housing. Uh, way back when, when there was affordable housing built, and money was not as readily available, $250,000 for affordable housing sounded like a lot of money. And it was. And many people that I know and many families that I know couldn't afford it. I'm not going to echo everything, but one thing I learned when I was in other capacities was that you need to look at the unintended consequences of your actions. And everything that people have been saying, I believe, are the unintended consequences. What looks good in one place might do harm in another. And you need to really look at that. What I came up to speak about was not the council members individually, but a plea to the city to not give away every piece of land to an independent developer 
And in this case, if it's PHA, that really is like almost like the PDA. They do their own thing. And you may at some point need land. Every time I go out, I see a new housing development. I see something new. I went to the cemetery, and I guess I've been on another planet, looked up and saw the white fence and all the houses behind there on the old Stokel property. We need to be careful of our assets. We had one debacle with a prime piece of property that the city is no longer going to be able to use for its own purposes and for its people. Let's guard what we have. And that's, that's what I really wanted to say. Please, don't give the property away. I don't know what the stipulations are from uh, New Hampshire Housing. Can the property be leased for 75 years for a dollar or $10 or whatever you want to do? But don't give it away in perpetuity, please. Thank you. Thanks, Jackie. Next up is Sue Polidora on the topic of questions. Sue Polidora, Middle Street. And I, I just had a few things that have been going through, uh, through my head. And I cannot understand why the council is not paying attention to the concerns of the people of Panaway. It almost sounds to me that it, this is a done deal. Uh, and it sounds to them the same way. We need to give the reasons, the whys and wherefores, and do an explanation. They have very valid concerns. It is not wise for you to ignore them. They got to be heard. They got to be addressed. It's not something that you can just put aside. Um, I echo the, uh, the words of Jackie Kelly Pitts. This is our land. You should be doing, keeping it, uh, Managing it, it is Portsmouth land. And just to give it away and put it in the hands of other entities is not a good thing. Uh, also, aside from that issue, I just would like to know on the status of the new audit firm, uh, whether the contract, the new contract has been signed or not, and when the new audit, uh, the next audit is supposed to take place. I haven't heard anything about that, and I was just I'm just wondering, so that's why I put in questions. So, thank you. Thank you, Sue. Give a cricket um, next up is, I think, Nicholas uh, Risterio. 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 The Italian names, no one pronounces them correctly. Ristino. Ristino. Well. So, uh, my name is Nicholas Ristino. I'm from Portsmouth. I live on Colonial Drive. And I want to beseech the, the committee to please not simply build affordable housing on the Sherburne site with the scaled back design that was presented in tonight's agenda, which I really appreciate, but continue to look at other sites around the city where we can build affordable housing. I'm a lifelong resident of this city, and I have seen so many of the people that I grew up with not be able to afford to live in this town. Furthermore, there are so many other people who would love to move to Portsmouth but simply cannot afford to do so. Free market forces left unabated will continue the rapid gentrification of this city. And that will breed a provincialism and myopia if Portsmouth is simply a city for the rich. We need socioeconomic diversity in this city. That brings in new ideas, that brings in new blood, and that also lets people who've lived here their entire lives who have gone to our schools, who have played on our ball fields, come and, and raise their children in this city. Now, there's been uh, talk of a blue ribbon committee, and perhaps that would be a great way to allay the fears of some people who are unfamiliar with the processes surrounding building affordable housing. But I would urge the com committee to do that as soon as possible. I understand that tonight is just a night for presentations. I understand how municipal government works. I'm a public educator down in uh, Massachusetts. Uh, I understand how these processes work, but I urge the committee to act quickly, create a blue, committee, uh, blue room committee, and continue to look at properties around town, including in my backyard. Yes, please build this scale back plan at Sherburn School. Panoy Manor itself was built as workforce housing. It is well in keeping with the history and character of the neighborhood to do this, and I certainly hope that if Portsmouth is going to be the city of the open doors, we always pledge to do so, 
that we keep that door open for people of all sorts of different backgrounds. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicholas. Mark from the park. On the topic of Johnny Cash. Here it is, right, long awaited. Don't start yet. Let me find it. Okay. Oh, I lost it. I'm in trouble. Hey, what? Why don't you have somebody else come and I'll find what I'm trying to do? Okay. How's that? Mark. All right. Next up, before, we're going to put you at the end, so. We'll, so we'll, will I get a shot? I mean, yeah. three quarters of an hour might just end. Um, no, we're, we're going to keep going. Uh, Irish Mike. Uh, I'll it up when I get yeah. our, I look forward to it. Um, Irish Mike on our American flag. Good evening. Um, um, Michael Harn, Orchard Street. I, I spend most of my joyful summers at my liberal free camp. It's patriotic and respectful, and then most mornings I'll start my drive from my patriotic surroundings to the disrespectful city of Portsmouth. Always remembering to bring my passport because sometimes it's confusing, to, it's confusing if, if it's still an American city. Three holidays just passed where American flags should be, should be flown proudly on every st street like they do in most other towns. Mem Memorial Day and Juneteenth Day should almost go hand in hand. Most times, false history w will state that Junte Juneteenth Day as the, the last day of the remnants, remnants of slaves in Ga Galveston in Texas. But in fact, the Chacha Indians owned slaves for at least a year, a year after Juneteenth Day. The, the, the Emancipation Proclamation was signed in 1863 by Lincoln, but it, it wasn't till 1865 that General Garner, with Union soldiers, arrived in Texas and delivered the message of em emancipation. Some of the same Union soldiers were involved in one of the last battles of the South at the Charlestown racetrack. More than 265 getting killed and buried in mass graves. So, so, so the black residents of Charlestown decided to give them a proper burial and marched around the racetrack with more than 3,000 children, mostly black, sing, singing patriotic songs like America, and we rally around the flag and the Star Spangled Banner, lining the, gra lining the graves with flowers, calling, calling it Decoration Day, later, later becoming Memorial Day. Also in June, we have D-Day, when America had real teenagers that lied about their ages, and at the ages of 16, 17, and 18, stormed the beaches of Normandy. And a far cry, a far cry from the teenagers of today that are not show which bathroom to storm. R respect the American flag and fly it high and proudly to honor these great patriots. Always, always be respectful and follow proper flag protocol. American flag in the center at, at the highest point, first to be risen and last to, be, last to come down. State flag always on the right and local government flag on the left. If there's, other, if there's ever another flag f f flown, be, be it private flag or poli political flag, it should be flown in a separate pole and flown lower than any of the other flags and be smaller in size. In closing, in closing every holiday from now on, I expect to see the American flag flown proudly from each light pole like they do in ev every other town. Thank you. Thank you, Harris Mike. Uh, next is Francis Cormier on the topic of taxes. I guess that, uh, Francis Cormier, Melbourne Street. Um, um, I'm going to stay on the Sherbin School thing. Um, I went to Sherbin School in the sixth grade, and um, well, I don't understand why um, a developer can come to the city, sue the city for $2 million, and then still expect to get free land from the city. And, um, you know, not that I'm against low-cost housing, but um, back on Route 1, where St. James Church was, they built a high-rise there. And right around the corner from Water Park, there's another one. I think that's low-cost low housing. Um, and uh, 
right there across from Water Park is an empty lot. I think it was a Burger King, and I think it's like two or three acres. It's really big, and it's just sitting there uh, gathering graffiti from kids, you know. Um, why doesn't the developer buy that land and build a high-rise or uh, low-cost housing there in the same vicinity as, as the high-rise where St. James was and around the corner from Water Park? They'd all be in the same, same area. Um, instead of going into a neighborhood at, at, at like Pianaway Manor and you know, bringing in something that's totally different than single-family housing, I'm sort of assuming that that's zoned, you know, the Leicester Academy area is zoned for single families, not high rise. Um, so why don't they just build where the abandoned Burger King is on Route 1 across from Water Park? I mean, it's a huge lot. See, but here's the catch. They've got to buy the land. Burger King doesn't give away free land like the city of Portsmouth does. So, so there you go. Um, uh, uh, and it, it, here's another thing, this, this developer sues the city and then he's on the front page of the newspaper and you're shaking his hand, patting him on the back because he successfully sued the city for $2 million. I mean, you shouldn't be patting him on the back, you should be giving him a boot in the rear end. Thank you, Francis. Next is Sean Muskie on the topic of Sherburn. Good evening, Council. Sean Muskie, uh, Sherman Avenue. Um, last time I was here, I talked about you guys giving away land for free. You guys made comments after about, we're not giving away free, we're getting workforce housing. I think you missed my point. <coughs> that school and that land has intrinsic tangible value to the city. Once it's gone, it no longer has that kind of value to the city. Sure, you might get 40, 80, 120, 5,000 units, however many you're gonna try and shove in there. And there's some not, not really tangible value to that. It gets some, some more residents in here. It, it, it might make it easier for a few people to commute. But there's no real tangible value as it is now to the city. Also, there were comments about, well, we don't want to have the school move out of there and have it sit idle. There's no reason why it would have to sit idle. The town owns it, the town can lease it, lease it to nonprofits, lease it to whoever, a business. It still stays a tangible asset to the city. Once it's gone, it's gone. The PHA will own it. I know you guys can put the people on the PHA board, or at least part of the one half of the board, but they will own it. They'll do what they want with it. We really won't have a lot of control over it. They will own it. And then also I've heard people keep saying that it's the largest, driest, just trying to make it sound like it's the right place. Maybe it's the largest. If you look at just that back lot, I don't know, that's not much larger than the parking lot right next to this building. And it's certainly, not necessarily the driest. This parking lot's pretty dry. The land over by Wamaset, that's dry too, even though it's got some deed restrictions, but we know the town has gotten around deed restrictions in the past. So please try, stop trying to make it sound like it's the best thing that we have available to us. It's not the driest. Nobody knows that for sure. A lot of the land around here is wet, a lot of it's dry. So I'm not going to talk a lot about the uh, conflict of interest of having um, Welsh on the board or on the, uh, the land use board. I think that's been covered pretty readily today. Um, but please, just listen to us. Overwhelmingly, this neighborhood is against what's happening there. If you just stopped, slowed down, listen to us, I'm sure we all could work together and figure something out but we don't feel heard. We don't feel like you're working in our best interest. I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. <laughs> Next up, Megan Corsetti, on the topic of the Sherburn. Good 
Megan Corsetti, Colonial Drive. Um, good evening. I'm eager to hear the presentation this evening from the PHA, but once again, it feels like the cart is being placed before the horse. I said it in January, and I'm gonna say it again this evening. We need to have a committee involved in the planning of this new development. Why are we hearing plans before this committee has been developed? There's so much to consider, and one paramount question that has not been asked is where the residents of our next affordable housing development would like to live. After attending several meetings and doing my own research to better understand, this is what I'm hearing. Yes, there is a need for affordable, attainable housing in Portsmouth, but there are also only four viable city-owned parcels of land left to be developed for any city use that we may need as a community today and in the years ahead. And for this reason, any assets owned by the city and therefore owned by the citizens of Portsmouth should be placed on a ballot to vote. The 20,488 registered voters of this city should have a say as to what assets are given away. I think there's a missed opportunity tonight to not be hearing about the lower lot at City Hall and the other identified sites in addition to Sherburn. When making a large purchase or a big decision, don't you take the time to do your research and see what option makes the most sense? If it's Portsmouth families you wanna help, the South End is a cool place to live with beautiful recreational courts and fields. And if a housing complex was there, then some of the best of what Portsmouth has to offer would be their backyard. The lower lot is also walking distance to Little Harbor, a school that has the capacity to educate more students, walking distance to Portsmouth Middle School as well. And if you were listening when the COVID Blue Ribbon Committee made a report out a few meetings ago, you would have heard that transportation, specifically school bus drivers, were in short supply. Housing on the lower lot would not impact or increase the needs for buses. However, it would at Sherburn or the other two identified sites. With Sherburn, perhaps there's an opportunity to create permanently affordable homes there, something that residents of Ruth Griffin Place and a lower lot development could graduate towards purchasing with the help of the hometown grant that the city has. Because there is a need for permanently affordable homes for purchase too. A development of this scope would blend better into a suburban single family home neighborhood. We have to be thoughtful. We need to make sure that the, any addition to this neighborhood is respectful. And our city's master plan states just that, allowing for incremental increasing in density of housing. And that the look and feel of the city's suburban neighborhoods should remain grossly unchanged. The potential is there and home ownership is the American dream for so many. So an approach of this style would allow there to be some movement with the housing life cycle, ensuring residents the opportunity to stay and grow within this community. There's so much we could do, but you must listen and involve members of the community. So I hope tonight I leave you and the PHA looking through a different lens because there is more than one way to accomplish this goal you are trying to achieve. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Next up, Aaron Garganta. On the topic of the Sherwin. Aaron Garganta, 423 Colonial Drive, on the topic of Sherburn. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor, City Council, City Manager, thank you. Um, I'd like to thank all my neighbors and those who are coming out tonight for speaking on very eloquently on their concerns about the development at Sherburn. Um, you've heard some very good arguments and concerns this evening. I'm going to focus on some more specifics of what I've read up on the project so far. I don't want to get too passionate about it because I might not communicate everything I want to say. So a um, couple of things that I have concerns about the process to date is I, I have to say I was less than impressed with the very unscientific approach to evaluating the city owned properties and their potential uses for development as affordable housing. I think this city could have put forth a much more detailed effort um, related to evaluating the properties. I, I still am unclear why four acres of flat dry ground out at the community campus right next to some uh, fields or courts is not on the approved list for affordable housing considering its proximity to Lafayette Road, businesses, public transportation, <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm, I could not make the 9 a.m. land use meetings to hear if there was an explanation, but 
rumor has it that there, that property is earmarked for other things. And, and that leads me to my other concern is the lack of transparency around the other things is that if you were to hold a transparent and inclusive discussion about developing affordable and workforce housing, because the city needs both affordable housing and workforce housing, I don't want to talk about them as if they're the same thing, because workforce housing can command a higher rate of rent that makes development on certain parcels of land more realistic because the ROI on the project is higher. Getting back to the lots that are available for development in the city, I'm disappointed that the approach did not also include evaluating private parcels of land that could be purchased for the purpose of uh, developing affordable or workforce housing. There are other pieces of land that the city may not own that may increase the cost of development for the PHA, but may be better suited for the development of this type of housing closer to the infrastructure that's necessary for people to not have to drive everywhere they want to go, like you would if you build in the Panaway Manor area. Um, I also noticed, because I read ahead in your presentation tonight, that the scope of the presentation does not include the redevelopment of the Sherburn School. And it recommends that should the city want to redevelop Sherburn School or some other private entity, that they could do so or not. And we may not see what we're going to fully develop and build out that piece of property for. So one of my requirements would be as a member of the community is that this project gets developed and approved as a whole without leaving out Sherburn School for some future project. The neighbors deserve to see what the fully built out piece of property entails and does not leave the door open for somebody to come along later on and say, that school's too expensive to rehabilitate. We need to tear it down and now we need to build another 80 units of housing in its place. So I'm, I'm a cynic by design. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. Um, again, if it's not redeveloped, then that school will further sit there for additional years with no additional investment and will continue to deteriorate and become a blight on the neighborhood. Um, currently, as the traffic study was done on the project, the property is designed for 111 units. Um, the traffic study took advantage of what they call a COVID stay-at-home adjustment, which reduces the quantity of traffic generated by the project. Um, I'm not sure that we have fully recovered from a global pandemic to take into an assumption that people are going to work at home forever. And I would recommend that develop, de development use a fully weighted traffic study to account for the amount of traffic that the project is going to develop and not try to take a COVID stay at home adjustment when they calculate the number of vehicle trips in and out of the development. Um, it also currently does not take into account the residential piece of property that is between Orchard Park and the city owned piece of property, which I know there, there was some discussion at the last meeting about either the PHA or the city approaching the neighborhood, the neighbor about selling their property, um, which would allow for additional housing to be built beyond what is shown in the current plan on the traffic study. Um, and I guess my, my I'll, uh, I'll leave you with this, is that I, I do believe that the city needs affordable and workforce housing. I don't disagree that this is a site that is appropriate for housing of some magnitude. Um, I, I would like to see a comprehensive and transparent master planning process for affordable and workforce housing that is inclusive of the different neighborhoods that would be affected and takes into account feedback from the neighbors, takes into account feedback from people who want to live in this housing, um, and also, you know, is appreciative of the fact that the city-owned property is an asset to not just the city management, it's an asset of the city. <clears throat> I know as currently proposed, the, the plan calls for a land lease to the PHA, so the city retains ownership of the property, um, according to the presentation. That is the recommendation of the developer. 
that the city retains ownership of the property. I'm not sure what that looks like from a liability standpoint, who owns the liability for activities that happens on the land when the city owns the land and the leaseholder owns the building. Um, but they, there, there are still many, many questions that I, I think you'll hear from the comments and the people in this room that we're not fully ready to support what you're gonna hear about tonight, but I think people are ready and prepared to be engaged in the process. It just needs to be a transparent process and it needs to not solely focus on the Sherburn parcel and push everything else to the side until the Sherburn parcel is developed. I think there is room and time to develop a comprehensive plan for affordable housing. So we know what, where the next project is right behind it. Because if you read, if you hear the proposal, the housing needs are so urgent that we have to do this now or else we will just kick the can down the road. So we should be thinking of not just this project, but the next three projects for the PHA, and that other members and other neighborhoods across the city can be part of that process, and you can hear from them as well and not just us, because I feel like this group is shouldering that burden for the majority of the city, and when we shoulder that burden and come out in public and speak about it, we get viewed as people who are against affordable housing, which I think is anything but the truth, because we pretty much all live in what Portsmouth considers current affordable housing. So it just so happens that that affordable housing is now worth about a half a million dollars a home, but that's only happened in like the last seven years. So I'm sure none of us could afford to buy our homes back if we were to sell them today. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Next up, Cami uh, Saunders on the topic of the Sherburn. Hi, City Councilors. Um, I just, you're going to be hearing a lot of reoccurring themes tonight, but um, I just have to say that our neighborhood is much more important than your political ambition. You can't expect us to take one for the team by accepting a development that's not at all right for this neighborhood so you can add a bullet point to your resumes and move on. We are the taxpayers. We are the people who this development will directly impact in many ways, and you have an obligation to listen to our voices and to stop these plans. Like your purchase of the community campus swampland with taxpayer dollars, this purchase is another example of what happens when you rush into something so that you will look good on paper without the necessary due diligence to ensure it is right. You've abused your power by jumping into an agreement with the PHA on this, at the mayor's and council's direction, they spent quite a lot of money drawing up premature plans for the Sherburn location. So when those same people sit on the land use committee and in their study, Sherburn is determined to be the number one choice for development, wow, what a shock. Of course, your study uh, results will always support your agenda, and this is a huge conflict of interest that we have all seen. So um, also, uh, which has come up before too, but how long ago did the PHA do their traffic study and what, what methods were used? An unbiased study done by professionals with nothing to gain from their findings should be required, and it's certainly not another PHA study. The only way in and out of our neighborhood is to drive by the Sherburn School. Was the study done before or after Liberty Mutual decided to close its Dover office and move an additional 1,200 of its workers right up the street? All this impacts our neighborhood. So my final words are stop steamrolling ahead and back off of this project. You do not have the support for the majority of our neighbors that this will impact. Listen to us. Listen to us. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Peter Harris on safety and outside dining. Good evening. Peter Harris, 249 Islington Street. While I have another topic, not on Sherburn, I do want to, before I address my topic, share my complete and total support of the Panaway residents for the process, participation, data they seek. And hope that the PHA properties 
are being considered for being upsized as part of the evaluation. So I sent you all uh, an email and um, a link on a uh, post on Facebook through the unofficial site. I don't know if you got to see that or so on, but um, I'm concerned, as I think a lot of residents that were in this post voiced their concerns of the intersection of Congress Street, Middle Street, Islington, and Maplewood Avenue, right there at that intersection. It is looks like a disaster, and not a, not just because of the construction that's going on. If that weren't there, I still feel it's a safety issue that the city council should be concerned with. Um, I just don't understand the on-street dining at Congress Street for the Goat and Jumping Jays. I don't understand how they were approved when the Clipper wasn't approved. Doesn't make sense. It is the busiest intersection in the downtown grid. And you've blocked off a lane, and this, the, the sight vision for cars coming up to that intersection, you've got the barriers all the way up to the crosswalk. You can't see around the corner. You can't see if there's any pedestrians even waiting in the crosswalk. And if you're a pedestrian, you can't even see if there's cars coming through the inter to, in the intersection. Now, granted, cars are slowing down. They're concerned. But I sent you pictures. I, I've posted some online. It's a safety and a liability issue for the city. Karen Kennard and staff recommended not to do this. Why? Have you thought about that? Did you think about that, Andrew? It is a serious thing that you went and pushed in the January meetings on outside dining. I am not against outside dining. I just think there is a serious liability issue if something goes wrong, some, there's an accident, your insurer might not cover the city. That could be a serious issue, a legal case. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> Next up, Eric Anderson on the topic of the Sherburn. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, City Council members. My name is Eric Anderson, uh, 38 Georges Terrace. I'm in the Panaway Manor neighborhood, or Sherbin neighborhood. I think all the previous speakers have hit all the high notes of my concerns. And so there's no real need to repeat them, and I hope you've taken the appropriate notes of their, of, of what they brought forward to you. Um, let's not forget the largest meeting I ever attended through the course of my going to public meetings and during the course of your tenure was held this past winter at the Sherbin School on this particular subject. So I hope you recognize the sensitivity of this issue within this neighborhood and this community. And um, proceed in a manner that I think is a little bit different than what I'm suspecting might take place. Uh, the process this evening is not the best course, I don't think. Later on in the meeting, you're going to get a presentation by PHA on what they might, might be a proposal. There's not going to be any public comment on that presentation. It's made, it's made to you. I'm not sure what type of public comment is going to be initiated from that PHA presentation to the rest of the public so that they can, they can pass uh, opinion on what PHA is proposing. You've already announced that there's no action this evening, but there's action at the next council meeting. What is that action is? What, what's going to be that action? I think the public has a right to know what that action is in preparation of what you, you're going to be deciding at the next council meeting. Is it to accept the PHA proposal? Is it to have any type of process that, 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 that brings the public into discussion of this subject? I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm suspect of the process that's been announced or, or 
um, in development and that it's not inclusive of the type of sensitivity that you've heard from the public on this subject and especially from the neighborhood. You've stated um, that you're going to have, that, that there might be assembling a blue ribbon committee on this particular issue. I think that, you know, I would advise that that could, you know, to go forward in some manner and let that committee discuss this particular issue prior to the council taking any action. I think that's appropriate, but I'm, 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 a, I'm, a, little, I'm a little suspicious of what, what the direction is at this particular time and that there is no public comment process at least announced right now or in any way, shape, or manner for the concerns of the public that's here and the concerns of the public that attended that winter meeting in Sherbin School to understand what's going to be taking place with this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. So just to um, underscore uh, maybe some of the concerns tonight, there's not action being taken. Um, from the presentation, we will then come back at the next meeting with either, uh, I guess with whatever we do, a, um, a process to involve the public in that. And so I'm sorry that there's not like a, a debate on a topic here tonight. We're gathering information and your public comment is an important part of that information. We're going to hear from the PHA later on this evening and then we're going to have more comment conversation, public comment next week or two weeks from now. But next up is Paige Trace on the topic, as always, Portsmouth. Well, you've been at Portsmouth, so you can always change your mind on the way up. Exactly. Paige Trace, 27 Hancock Street. This document, although nicely done, is also in the packet. I read it this afternoon. There is absolutely nothing in the way of process, transparency, respect for these people in the audience. This is about transparency. This is about process. And they are going to shoulder the burden of your decision. Now, you've heard for the 55th time tonight that everyone agrees that we need workforce housing. That's not the issue. The issue is that, as this report states right on the back, this report authored by PHA Housing Development Limited for the city of Portsmouth. So there's a lot of conversation that obviously goes back and forth between you and PHA and the land use department or land use committee that Mr. Welsh, who's down at the bottom of this as the executive director, who I'm not even entirely sure is here tonight, wouldn't you think he'd think it important enough to be here? Or has that already been decided? This is, this is serious stuff. This affects all these people that potentially voted for all of you. And you owe it to them as your residents to listen to them, not to talk at them. Councillor Bagley, as you did at the famous meeting of 350 strong, I was there. And I know the cake was already baked then. Because when I walked in early, there were 15 seats set up. That's all you sort of expected to show up. And this community cares enough, this neighborhood, that there were 350 people. You know that, Mayor. They've told you countless times how they feel about this. And what have you done? You've taken the votes of someone on the land use board who's on the back of this cover. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. I feel like I've gone down the rabbit's hole to the Mad Hatter's Tea Party and you were supposed to be there, sir, protecting all these people and you weren't. One other thing, while we're at it, it's not a good night for all of you. 
50,000 square feet for McIntyre. A lot of different things that you're going to give people, incentives, but the fact of the matter, 50,000 square feet is a Walmart. Is that what you're putting in the center of town? The possibility of a Walmart. Thank you very much. Please listen to these people. Next up, Pete Chihuda on bond resolutions, PHA process. Good evening, Pete Chihuda, 280 South Street. First thing I'd like to talk to you about is the, um, the bond resolution. I have some questions about the resolutions in the packet. In summarizing the total of all the resolutions in the packet, we come up to 38 million six, one of the largest in a few years after approximately 30 million plus last year. I'm asking the city council to ask, has the money from last year been spent? What is the status of the projects from last year <coughs> before you move for more money this year? That's the first thing. Next thing I question, and I'm con definitely confused on the amount for school. Uh, what it has listed is 550 for 550,000 for school facilities. Fine. Then you're changing the authorization on the elementary school facility to Lister, and you're put you have in here fit up of community campus for Lister, and the total is 3,850,000. My question is, what happened to the ESSER funds on this? I do believe we were told that we were going to be using ESSER funds. So I guess I'd like some clarification on, on what happened there. And I understand that the, if you bond for this, you can't use the ESSER funds. So if somebody could please clarify um, why, why we aren't using them and why it's not listed in here. Next is my favorite topic that's come up again, Foundry Price parking offices. So. I did a little analysis, and this is the most, this parking is the most discussed topic in Portsmouth. So do we really need to convert the parking garage, the brand new parking garage, to offices? So doing the math, the Foundry Place offices, the bond request is 1,250,000, and we're paying this is for 4,500 square feet. That would come out to a cost of $277.78 per square foot. So I did a Google and I went in and asked, how much is the rent in Portsmouth for office space? And I, I won't go over everyone, but Commerce Way has a whole bunch at $14.50 $14 per square foot. Cage Street, 1775 per square foot. All the way up to the largest one, which is Chapel Street, at $38 a square foot. So I would ask you to ask the question about why this is a good deal for the residents of Portsmouth when we could save a million dollars if we really have to put all the parking people together and go into one of these other buildings. Next, I want to talk about briefly on, on the, the presentation that's in the packet on Sherburn. There's lots of questions. I looked at page nine, and my questions are for the council. This is PHA's, obviously, their interpretation of the process. We haven't heard yours. And it brings up a lot of questions. If I look at the bottom of the first column, preliminary analysis, it says, City Council resolution to proceed. Have you done that? Have you voted? Have you had a public hearing on this? Is our PHA confused? Next one, engagement. Same thing, City Council resolution on disposition. Disposition of what? So when the City Council looks at this, 
I urge you to look at the RSAs that govern who can put this out and how many public hearings you have to have. This is an independent developer, and it doesn't matter if this is a nonprofit. It has absolutely nothing to do with it. This should be put out for an RFP before any decision is made. Please follow our, our city laws. Thank you. Next is Sean Maloney. Shane. Sorry, penmanship. Hello, my name is Sean Maloney, a uh, lifelong resident of Portsmouth, born in this building, actually. Um, so I've got a few talking points. I had absolutely no idea about Sherburn. I'm an overseas contractor, and world events have dictated I've been gone a lot overseas recently. So I might be retouching things you've heard before. Uh, when I last was here, uh, we were still in the pandemic, but uh, basically every person who came in here was complaining about the bike lanes, and yet somehow they're still here. Um, just as I was walking my dog before we came here, I live on Lincoln Street. Um, excuse me, I live on Union Street, and we walked in Lincoln. A road biker just went screaming through every single stop sign. If you had done an analysis and know any city, recent city, D.C., New York, a bunch of places I've lived, you know that if you add bike lanes, you add traffic because they do not follow the law. They're a pedestrian when they want. They're a car when they want. The number one takeaway is they get the right of way whenever they want it. Also, too, we have like a four-month out-of-the-year time period where you can actually ride a bike in this city. Don't, be, don't make everybody else suffer because there's an extremely loud, annoying group that wants their way. Because, like I said, they are whatever they want to be. Uh, second, the Bartlett and Thornton intersection with the hilariously bad roundabout. I don't, wow. Just straight up, terrible idea. Roundabouts, however, are a good idea in certain aspects, which brings me down to the Elm and Bartlett intersection, if you want to call that, because now we have all the new condos down there, all bought by mostly people out of town, third and second and third homes, who I've heard are actually complaining about the train from the condo that they bought next to the train tracks. <laughs> Which I think a lot of the problem is, is there's so much outside investment and so many outside voices is that the constituents are no longer being listened to. That would have been a perfect location for the roundabout. But instead, we have a weird six and a half to seven eighths way intersection where nobody knows who's going what. You've got a blind turn coming from under the bridge and some places stop but don't stop. So I highly encourage that you take the roundabout idea get it out of the other intersection and put it in that one because it will not only slow down traffic, but it will also keep traffic moving, both from the new development and from the intersection on Islington Street. Uh, property tax and just the development of Portsmouth. The property taxes are out of control. And I've heard and I saw in most of your campaigns you said you would address it, but no one's actually done anything about it. We've to the point now, again, I was born and raised here, people are selling their backyards to fit people in because they can't afford the property tax rate because they have a nice backyard and they're taxed even more for it. And what it's doing is it's turning New Hampshire, or Portsmouth I should say, into a really trashy Massachusetts suburb where it's just overgrown, it's overbuilt, and we are watching, if I could just have a few more sentences. People want to keep Portsmouth, Portsmouth. It is not looking well at all. The downtown is overdeveloped. The outdoor dining just needs to die. It's a legacy of COVID, and let's face it, COVID's over, despite a lot of people's attempt to keep that going. It needs, again, we need to keep Portsmouth, Portsmouth, over development, outside actors, every piece of green space is being bought up, and they're, they're not putting up homes, or the few places are putting up homes, but again, half a million dollar condos and million dollar houses are not affordable housing, and that's not New Hampshire or Portsmouth people who are buying those. It's outside forces. Your elected officials by elected by people who are here, listen to them. Don't listen to outside forces. Don't listen to developers. Let Portsmouth stay Portsmouth before it turns into down south. Thank you. Sean. Next up, Kate Fish on the topic of Sherburn. Hi, 
Um, I am one of the residents of the 19 houses most um, directly affected by the Sherburn housing um, proposal. So I'd like to just speak quickly again about my concerns of bringing this large housing project to our quiet single family neighborhood. I know lots of my neighbors already did a great job of bringing up points, so I'll be really quick. Um, I know that you have an agenda, but I also know, um, or it's also disappointing that I feel like the concerns that were brought to you pretty early on um, after hearing the proposal, none of those, at least from everything that I have watched and listened to um, and what I could attend, I haven't heard any of those really brought up by any of the council members. And I don't feel like those were ever really represented publicly during discussions. And I feel like most of them, or at least some of them, were very valid. Um, I will speak quickly about traffic. I was going to talk about Liberty Mutual, but that was already said. Um, but it's one way in, one way out. And there is already, during peak hours, um, lots of congestion getting out to, once you get you know, out past or, or get to Orchard Park, going to either um, Route 1 or 33 is already very congested. And I think that it's important that perhaps um, a traffic study be conducted by an impartial third party so that we can really see clearly how that's going to affect um, or how this could potentially affect um, the neighborhood. Um, I feel I we a lot of us showed up at the neighborhood meeting and voiced concerns um, and I wish it was recorded so I could go back and hear a lot of those valid concerns because um, I I know that it was said or mentioned that those concerns and questions would be addressed they haven't I don't think they haven't been addressed yet but I'm hopeful that they will be. Um, and as things were stalled, the neighborhood voices sort of naturally dwindle over time. So I'm glad to hear um, a lot of them tonight. But there were many, many more people um, at the neighborhood meeting that spoke um, and I think should be considered. I understand the need for housing. I also think the process taken to get where we are seems sort of haphazard and flawed. Um, as well as not inclusive of the neighbors. So I hope if the site moves forward for housing, you consider the scope of this project. For example, a four-story building or more than 40 units in this single-family neighborhood um, and consider the impact it will have on the neighborhood and the current residents. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Rick Bexted on the topic of being fair. Good evening, Rick Bexted, 1395 Islington Street. I'd like to at least thank the mayor for letting people extend the time. Um, usually with normal sec set of circumstances, 15 people speak, 45 minutes, and I appreciate that for everyone here that's here tonight. Um, just want to go over a few things as far as with, and it is Sherman School and being fair. Now, Mayor, I think the way I would have done it, to be fair, would have had a presentation and then been able to have a public forum or comment on this specific topic, meshing it into all others. I know all of you who work, you have families and jobs. I did, and I attended a lot of meetings, at least the ones that we couldn't when we were in person. But I think that would have been a better way to go about doing it. So I guess. This is now your time and your chance to be able to do that before you go, I guess, and stumble again as far as, I don't want to say pissing people off, but there are people that are really pissed off in the room. So I'll just go and give a little bit of background and advice as far as I know when it came to topics, it took four plus years that we went with countless meetings, both televised and neighborhood meetings that happened in DPW. I know of another subject that actually took place four and five years, and we had the exact same thing both as the process built and as we came to a conclusion. Those two subjects were, um, sorry, Pebbly Hill Road. We had multiple meetings. We actually, as a council, rode by and did several ones, and we had a special presentation on that one night, involved all the neighbors, and we worked with 100% concession from that entire road and that street. And I know that's not an easy thing to go and do, 
But that should be the goal for us, is to get as much concession as absolutely as possible um, when it comes to this. And the other subject was Middle Street, the bike lanes, which has still been an ongoing battle. And it went on profusely. And, and it's, it's there. But the, the, the point I'm trying to make is, is you've done this in five months, OK? Now, yeah, you've got an election, and people are going to assume things that there's an election that's coming up and you've got to get it done because you may not get reelected so you got to shove it down everybody's throat that's the perception not but done necessarily by you or done by purpose but that's what people are viewing you need to slow this down you need to give these residents time you're talking about quality of life people that have lived here grown up here raised families here been a part of our community volunteered went to our schools work in portsmouth it's their quality of life. Mayor, you talk about the city open doors. I agree with you. We should be the city the open doors. But I think sometimes we're a little bit too open. Too open. And if you really are worried about keeping them open, worry about the people that are in the room that already exist here rather than the people that are want to come and live and partake in Portsmouth. I, I, think we need, I think we need to slow this down a little bit. I think there's a better way to go about doing this. You need to involve this community more. This is just this community. You will be hearing from other parts of the community all over Portsmouth. If it can happen to their neighborhood, it can happen to theirs. Thank you very much. Next up, uh, Lisa Haggerty McMahon on 179 Union Street and sewer separation. Yes, good evening, Mayor. Hi again. Um, and council, I don't mean to interrupt what seems to be a really very important topic of Sherburn School, and I'll preface this. I didn't come here for the Sherburn School issue. I've learned a lot tonight. Um, I did attend Sherburn School myself, so I'll just say that I, I, I hope that the city finds a good balance of what it's trying to accomplish very much. Um, but the question or I have for the council tonight is just a follow-up to last council meeting. Um, the sewer separation project was going to result in uh, removing uh, brick from the uh, frontage of 179 Union Street. It is an historic building. I mentioned last two weeks ago, um, not in an historic district. And so I think there was going to be a vote at some point, but I don't. I didn't want it to fall off the radar and then the DPW to just kind of wipe out the brick and say, so late, so sorry. So that's kind of where I'm, I'm coming from on that. Um, is there a way for me to find out if there will be a vote in the future, or is? I don't how, think we need. I think we. No, I can follow up with you, Lisa. Yeah, separately, oh, so I can talk to you separate, and it will be handled. Okay, so you don't have to vote, and the city can do it. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Can I make one quick comment about 179 Union Street as well? It, I appreciate the city would actually um, do this one small thing that I think is quite. Important. It's not a large-scale thing, but what I'm hearing tonight is about worry about a lot of development in the city, and um, on a small scale, our little building in, in the West End has um, had a developer move in and actually um, chop down a tree next to our, which is on our lot, and then kind of say, "Oops, thought it was mine." And this is a five-foot diameter tree, so I, I think that there does need to be some more regulation and attention, I think, to the development, small scale, large scale, and I'm not sure what that looks like, but I, I appreciate the council hearing about that because historic building, massive old tree, and someone comes in and wants to chop it down because he's building something right next to us. So I, I'm, I'm hoping to figure out a way to rectify that. Um, but thank you for the handling the brick situation. Thank you, Lisa. We have one on Zoom. Uh, we're going to go back to Mark and his, uh, his Portsmouth resident. Oh, no, sorry. You're not a Portsmouth resident, right? No. No, okay. But, yeah. Um, we'll go to Eliza Hewitt. Always see you so much, Mark. I forget. Are you ready for me? Yes. Yes, Eliza. Okay. Hi, my name is Eliza Hewitt. I live at 726 Middle Road. And I have significant concerns about the intersection of Congress and Maplewood as it is now configured. Who in their right mind would think this is safe? That intersection is a death waiting to happen. 
what price are we willing to put on people's lives for some members of the city council's perception of vibrancy? I understand that tonight you will discuss a new pedestrian crossing plan for the Labrie property. This will not fix the problem at that corner. As city staff recommended this spring, no traffic lane should have been allowed to be used for dining, and that includes Jumpin' Jays and the GOAT. Dining in the street at those two locations is lunacy. I commented at the June PTS meeting, as well as last week's EDC meeting, about the complete blockage of sight lines at this intersection caused by barriers, shrubbery, heat towers, and screening with imprints of goats on them. Nothing has changed. Please, city staff, if the council does not have the sense to reverse the outdoor dining decision at this corner, you demand it right now. As a taxpaying resident with a conscience, I do not want to be responsible for injury or death of a resident or visitor and do not want to pay for the lawsuit that follows. Thank you. Thank you, Liza. The floor is yours, Mark. Well, I actually came in here thinking I had nothing to really talk about, but there's plenty. I'll do it another night. But in the meantime, let me just play a little song for you. You might enjoy it. See you Whoops, I just lost it. Three minutes on. I lost it. Hold on. <laughs> Timer's on, Mark. Can you bring me back? What's that? You could sing it. Oh, no, I can't sing. I'm, learning, I'm learning guitar, but I can't sing. Okay, here it is. Here we go. Nope. All right, I'll tell you what, we'll just talk. Um, I was very annoyed walking in here today and seeing one of the poster boards um, with the transgender, uh, trans, you know, whatever they do in front of the little kids. They're promoting it for all ages. I guess there's a place in Summersworth, but you're advertising it right here, right here. I mean, you walk in, you can read one of those boards. What's that all about? Why are you promoting this stuff? I don't get it. And as far as these people are concerned, I really feel bad for them. I don't live in this town anymore. But they've got a big point, and I'll bet none of them know what's going to go happen in the park, uh, Prescott Park. I bet nobody knows about this. I've been t up here twice now talking about that. So seeing how you're going up 6% on the taxes, I think everybody should know what's going on in the park. And I think you should add that to the tax bill and let people know what's going on. You put it on hold because you say you have no money. Well, I thought you floated a bond for like 15 to 17 million back five, six years ago. Would that be a true statement? Probably. I want to know what's going on. Where'd the money go if you, if you did float a bond? You're going to move the Shaw building. You have no money to put into it. That makes no sense. All right? Anyway, I'll play Johnny Cash for you another time forward to it. All right. Okay. But I bet you nobody in this audience knows about what's happening at Prescott Park. I'm going to put the together and we'll all look at it. All right. Um, can we just take the conversations um, outside? Your Honor, I move to suspend the rules to bring forward item number 13A, which is the presentation by the Portsmouth Housing Authority. Is there a second? Oh, second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Good. We will do the, I'm guessing that most folks are here to hear the presentation and maybe not the email correspondence. So let's do that. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Councilors, City Manager, City Attorney. I'm Tom Farini, and I'm the chairman of the Portsmouth Housing Authority. I'm also the secretary of Portsmouth Housing Limited, one of the two nonprofits that we serve on. And with me is Adam Rudig, and he is the president of Portsmouth Housing Limited. Um, I observed with some consternation that I was item 13 on the agenda. 
And uh, <clears throat> I suppose, given what the community has been going through and thinking about here, when we make our remarks tonight, what we want to get across is just we have responded to a request to look at feasibility of workforce housing on the site. And I think everyone agrees that there's a well-documented need for additional housing to be built in Portsmouth. And the Sherburn site does meet criteria which are great for workforce housing, economies of scale, neighborhood context, historic preservation, environmental conditions, et cetera. The truth is that given the way things are going with development in Portsmouth, we agree that Portsmouth development is a significant item. And part of the problem that it does create for us is that we do not have enough housing for people who uh, do not have sufficient income to live in the very high rent and mortgage-driven properties of the city. So in terms of being here tonight, there's been a lot of questions from the, um, the from the public, and I think we want to be very clear that from a process perspective, we're merely giving you our report. We would expect and anticipate, as we indicate on page 9, which someone was kind enough to reference, you know, we put a sort of key milestones picture in there for how process might occur. We would anticipate and appreciate additional public process. We are in no way looking to go forward without additional public process. And if the council were to create a committee which then dealt with this issue, that's something if we can help, we would we'd be happy to present. But the real point is we can't do our job if we don't have that public process in hand. And again, political leadership we would expect would engage in that. Now that said, um, because of the critical need for housing, we did this analysis at the at request of the city, spending our funds from the two nonprofits um, for Portsmouth Housing. And I'd like to at least have an opportunity to let Adam present uh, a little bit about what the site analysis is to date. This is not a plan to construct a project right now. It is not, okay? And so it would be our intent to present this. Once the council hears that, we can talk a little bit more about, and I'd be curious to hear what the council's suggested process might be. But in addition, I should also point out that in the event it's the wisdom of political leadership of the city of Portsmouth to do an RFP, to engage in any sort of process that includes others, we understand that. And the reason that we would, um, if, if that's what the city council decides it wants to do, we participate, but please understand, and our belief is that after 70 years of doing this in Portsmouth with boards that are local and non-paid, doing it in accordance with federal low-income housing tax credit law, it's not a mystery, and housing authorities throughout the country have used this two corporation set up to do this kind of housing. So this is a this is something that we can certainly talk about at great length. But I don't think right now the concern and interest of the public is that. I think it's it's in everyone's best interest for us to briefly let you know what our analysis is of the site as it stands. We have some rough plans there for you to consider, but we anticipate that there would be further dialogue with the community and further input on how something might be done or if something might be done. So with that, I'd turn it over to Adam and let him speak a little bit to the site analysis. Sure. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. Adam Rudig, I am the president of the Portsmouth Housing Authority Limited Board, and I wanted to say a couple quick things about the way that we analyze sites for possible development, including the Sherburne School site. Um, one of the most important issues and one that's come up time and time again for us is economies of scale. Um, there's such a huge need for housing in our community, many communities, but it's dramatic in Portsmouth. Um, and the resources available to construct this housing, both in terms of financing from the low-income housing tax credit program that we use as a primary resource, but also in terms of our organization. We're a nonprofit organization. We don't have infinite capacity to do these projects, which are very complex, means that when we undertake a project, it needs to do a lot to solve the problem. And so small projects don't achieve that the way that larger projects do. That's why economies of scale are so important in our analysis. Um, 
as a rough rule of thumb, we look to undertake projects that can, where we can build at least 40 units of housing. Obviously, the more we can build, the more we're doing to solve the problem. But you know, th it's, it's a question of designing a project that passes that minimum threshold and is appropriate for the site. Um, neighborhood context is very important for us. Um, we want to make sure that this is an appropriate place for people to live when we undertake a building and that it's appropriate in the neighborhood that we're considering. We think at the Sherburne School site, it's an appropriate transition between the high density commercial neighborhood on Borthwick and the lower density residential neighborhoods to the south and in the Panaway neighborhood. And so we feel that that's an appropriate transition site between those two parts of the city for this type of project. Um, some specifics about the site, which we think are advantageous. Um, one of them is the site topography. I think everybody has been out there probably at this point and understands that the back half of the site is significantly lower than the street. This gives us the opportunity to construct a building on the back half of the site and it would diminish the visual impact of that building on the street. I think that's important. Also, the existing school there would help further that. Um, Another thing with the existing site is the existing historic building. We have a history in our organization of developing and preserving historic buildings in Portsmouth. Obviously, that's part of what's important in our community. It's very important to us as well. Um, as part of the study that you asked us to do, we hired um, a third party to do some environmental analysis. That's important that we're not going to run any, into any serious environmental conditions on a site. That preliminary study has been completed and we understand from that study that this site is uh, appropriate from an environmental perspective. The same thing with traffic. We hired a traffic engineer to complete a study. I think many of the people in the room have seen it. Some have probably read it. It's long. Um, but that's an important concern and one that will remain a concern if this project moves forward. The initial analysis says that we would be adding on top of existing travel through the site something like 41 trips during peak hours. That amounts to roughly one car, um, what was it, one car, it's not one car per hour, it's 41 trips, um, which is a fairly low impact for a project like this. Um, and that's important for us to keep in mind. Um, and let's see, finally the last point, um, there's been a question raised about property taxes. Um, and whether or not this would be a project that would contribute property taxes. Um, we do, with our projects, pay what's called a, a payment in lieu of taxes, and so we're a nonprofit organization which is exempt from property taxes, but we do pay payments to the city in lieu of property taxes. We do that with our most recent development of Roost Place, and we expect to do that going forward. So a couple of comments about how we analyze the site and a couple other questions that have been raised. Thank you, just, Adam. Uh, thank you, Adam. And, and uh, before we, we're happy to take questions, just I would again direct you to page nine and, and be clear that these are key milestones that we or any entity would have to engage in if they were going to go forward and trying to bring workforce housing to market in the near future. So when you look down at the bottom, it says, you know, preliminary analysis, that's what we've just done. And then we, as Portsmouth Housing Authority, would, would like to see a city council resolution at some point to proceed. That's not the same thing as the disposition of the land where construction would occur. Rather, that would be the city council, after another set of process, community engagement, et cetera, uh, coming up with a resolution on disposition, which would be a ground lease. There have been a number of individuals who have thought that we would take ownership of this real estate and we would recommend, if the city's doing this anywhere, it would be a ground lease, whether it's with us or with somebody else. Uh, so we understand that that would be city land if we're able to go forward with the project. Some of the other timelines in here aren't as grabby uh, from a perspective of people who live in a neighborhood who are concerned about what's going on and want to have input. But the timing on all this is really very tight. Every year these tax credits get awarded and every year municipalities or housing authorities that exist in municipalities compete for these and so the reason we're here giving you what information we can is so that if you decide to go forward with some further process that process is what drives us meaning the tax credit award process and that's what constrains us 
And it's not quite the same thing as a market developer walking in that doesn't do tax credit property. Our job is to keep these properties uh, perpetually affordable, and we've done it. Your, the record is right here in Portsmouth, and we'd be happy to do it again, and we'd be happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Adam. Questions of the council? I have one just on um, a couple, but the mentioned by the public, uh, co or I think it was Aaron, uh, said COVID stay at home adjustment on the um, on the traffic study. Could you delve into that a little bit more? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you for the question, Mayor. Um, my understanding of the way that the traffic study was done is that there is, that COVID um, adjustment does exist, and congratulations to Aaron for reading that traffic study that closely. But my understanding of the, that adjustment is it's an un, it is an adjustment. To, that traffic study is made as a study of how much additional traffic this project would add to the existing traffic. And so that COVID adjustment, as I understand it, is an acknowledgement that existing traffic may be depressed over historical levels because of COVID. And so it may work a little bit differently than, than was quoted, but it's an attempt by the traffic engineers to try and get a real analysis long term of what the impact would be and not miss something like the short term impact of COVID. Okay. Follow up. So in other words, you're not reducing counts because of COVID or the engineer in the study is not. They're projecting an increase in traffic because of the waning of COVID. That's my understanding. I mean, they may apply that in two ways. They may say that the baseline rate is unnaturally depressed currently, but there may be some uh, work from home component in the future. But I know that at least they are reducing the baseline. Right. Um, well, in their study, they say they've added 13%, assuming people go back to work. Right. Um, can I? Make one more comment on that. I, the, the traffic study does include the Liberty Mutual relocation um, that many have brought up. It's an important concern, and the traffic engineers were aware of it and included it in the study. Thanks, Adam. Thank you. Sister Mayor. Thank you. Um, in the presentation, it does not include the school. Could you get a little bit of detail of why that was excluded for for redevelopment, the proposal? I'll, I'll you know. The answer is it's not included in this plan because, frankly, cost is a factor. That said, um, given that we anticipate public process and given that that's obviously an important building and, you know, I went to Lafayette School and now there's housing there uh, and then we built it, you know, it's something that we would look at and want to understand. It's something that we would have to look at in a broader context as to what the city feels it might want done with that property. And again, a lot of the concerns raised are, are interesting in that, you know, in the earlier iteration, a lot of people talked about other potential uses for that building. Um, and it, it makes it a more complex analysis for all of us, you know. But I do think we'd be open to further conversation and discussion about that. And I would hope anyone who would be looking to develop that lot would be but in our case we build housing and we try to build it in a timely fashion so that the many people the 64 units at Ruth Lou and Griffin place put workforce housing people right here in Portsmouth and we try to get from point A to point B as quickly as we can but we certainly want to do so in accordance with what is an appropriate public process thank you uh, Councilor Bagger yeah thank you Your Honor. I've got a couple of comments and a couple of questions some of them may be not answerable tonight, but just to give take under advisement. Um, in order to support any project, and I think uh, most people on the council and, and with, with your organization or other organizations we'd work with would be on the same page. But what we'd be looking at is a lease of some length of time, decades of course, up to say 100 years. And at the end of that lease, the property and all of its rights would return to the city. So. You know, my my granddaughter or grandson would would have the options of what to do with the property. Uh, the follow up is, is one: can you confirm that? And two: what are we looking at for range? Is it like fifty to ninety nine years, or is it kind of locked in by the L chip credits? I do you have a figure? 
And if you don't have that, just, you know, you can I mean, come that's back. something that we would – the answer is, you know, the practice – it's interesting. The practice of ground leases was initiated at Pease, and that happened back in time, and banks didn't know how to finance projects, and nobody knew how to deal with it. Now it's a pretty accepted practice. We would be looking at a longer, not a shorter term, and we would look within the strictures of what the uh, tax credit law allows. But our, our interest would be doing the, the longer term that we could. Okay. Can and then yeah, – Can I add oh, one comment? Yeah. Question? You know, when we develop these, these projects and get the tax credits that allows us to do those, there are some restrictions on the length of time these uh, house, homes have to remain affordable. And in our view, the longer the better. We develop uh, projects with, to be permanently affordable. And so, you know, that would probably factor in to your considerations about the length of the lease. That's okay. a calculation and an analysis that can be done by anybody that needs to do it in accordance with this. And we would certainly participate in that and would hope that that would be something that could be blocked out a little more clearly. But again, long term affordability, perpetual, that's what our goal is. Okay. And if I have a couple more, Your Honor, if I could follow up. Um, the uh, second one is, uh, you know, there, there's been a lot of talk about the, the RFP process. And, and I think there's a lot of. You know, there's a lot of validity to that talk. I look at it from the lens of PHA has a, a you know, really a sterling uh, record of uh, properties in Portsmouth over decades, and you guys have done an absolutely phenomenal job with the Court Street project. Uh, I've been to several events there where uh, the local community colleges are launching initiatives with that project to get people. Uh, you know, on a pathway to success. Uh, many of the people that live there are stalwarts of our community, the people that are, you know, taking care of our kids. Uh, you know, Freddie, who you see walking everywhere and doing all that work, I, uh, I got bridged. And I, I believe you have a scaling system for when people apply, because we have far more people applying than there are spaces. And there's a prioritization for people that already live in Portsmouth but are facing uh, their rent going up and having to choose to live somewhere else. Is Can you expound on that just a little bit and I honestly, how that works. I, I honestly can't tell you at this point, point for point, what that process is. It does exist. We are, it's a easily definable process. I just can't easily define it at the moment. Um, and uh, we do engage in a process that, that considers how people are, you know, what they make for income, where they live, and whether they're a veteran, et cetera. There are a variety of factors. And so we would hope, and certainly, if there's any public process in which you engage, that's something that we can elucidate further. And as far as an RFP process is concerned, you make the comment, it's not for us to decide that. We're here saying we're housing people who do this. Um, I think that's for the council's consideration. I do think, uh, depending upon how things go, perhaps with community involvement, the, the thing that we're also talking about is immediacy. And I appointed the Maybe it was the first Blue Ribbon Committee on Workforce Housing in 2008, or maybe it was 2011, but I think it might have been 2008, and we're still talking about it. We've, in the meantime, Portsmouth Housing's built some, and we're glad to continue to do that. All right, and then final question, and this is a little about out in left field, and I uh, apologize for not running it past the mayor or the city manager first, but in the funding scheme, uh, we're going to probably lose, if we build here, the softball field. And we have a plan to replace that field at the community campus with a CIP project. Is there any way that there would be any revenues generated that could be used towards uh, that new field for the city? From, from, the, from this housing project? Yes. And like I said, I don't need answers tonight. I'm just looking for is there any options for that type of thing? You know, that, I mean, that's a new idea to me. Um, you know, look, I'm, I'm here as a volunteer because I'm a resident of Portsmouth. So the more good things we can accomplish, the better. I, I'm not sure I see how that would, would happen, but, you know, it's a brand new idea. And that's all of my questions. And I, I thank you for your answers, and sorry for throwing uh, some curveballs there. Council Cook. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask some historical questions just for my information, and I don't know if you'll have the answers or not, but I just wanted to preface by letting you know that because I don't have those answers. Um, do you know how many Portsmouth Housing Authority projects we have in the city that are on city 
owned land that's on long-term leases or formerly city-owned land that was given to Portsmouth Housing Authority? Two. Right. I, think, I, think it's, I think it's two that are on long-term leases. Okay. Yeah. Connors Cottage, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Lafayette. Lafayette. Okay. Yeah. And what about um, properties that were formerly owned by the city that were – I I, I'm not so, aware of any recent any, any recent. Forty properties? Bedford Way was uh, formerly the Atlantic Elementary School, mm -hmm. um, right? And then the Islington, although it's operated differently, was the uh, was the high school uh, at one point. Which yeah, but that's not our, that's not a Portsmouth housing property. No longer. Keefe House. Yeah. Yeah. Keefe. yeah. It's not a housing Portsmouth okay. housing property, but it's tax credit. Okay. It's tax credit property, and Osprey's got some tax credit okay. property too, but they're not who we manage. Okay. but not who we operate okay. with. Remember, housing authorities were created by HUD far back in time, and then the tax reform bill of 1986 created a way to get the federal government out of private or out of ownership of HUD buildings, which is why Portsmouth Housing Limited exists. Right. <clears throat> yes, I was just trying to clarify that we this has happened before. We yeah, have an example right, right there in our at parking Connors lot. Cottage, yeah. Okay. Um, has the Portsmouth Housing Authority in the past bid on an RFP from the city to build housing on land. Has the city issued an RFP that I'm you not had to aware, bid on? I'm not aware that that's happened. In my recent knowledge, no. I mean, I'm kind of old, but not real old. Um, but in, in the answer is no, we have not. I think, you know, I would direct you to council and what the state laws are for RFPs and what they are not. Because I don't know that RFPs are required. Right. For uh, I, mean, I think the state, as I understand it, has to engage in an RFP process when they do something. I think the statute is pretty clear that it says state, so it doesn't say town, it doesn't say city. But again, that's I think that's for analysis to be undertaken by the city. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Councilor Moreau, then Assistant Mayor. Um, I know my understanding of the tax credit process when people buy the tax credits, it's a one-time thing where they buy the tax credits and they can use those credits, but they don't get future um, funds from their investment into a project. They do not. And that's the only way that investors actually invest in your project. Well, and I think it's important because there's a, perhaps a perception that there's some sort of ongoing investing and in, in, in tax credits are a one-time thing. You buy the tax credit, you get the benefit as the, if you're the business or whoever to the individual who's, who's contributing, and that creates the opportunity for the, the institutional investors to do these loans that allow us to build this property. Right. And I that's just, how it works. And it's a nationwide process done with housing authorities in partnership with nonprofit LLCs that do this. It is not the same thing, really financially as a private developer comes in and does it. Now, that said, it's important to point out, as Council Cook said, there are, and, and Mayor, Keefe House, Osprey, there are other tax credit properties in Portsmouth. They're not Portsmouth Housing Authority properties, but they were financed in a similar fashion. Mm -hmm. Can I add yeah. one thing to that on the financing? You know, the, the tax credits don't cover the entire cost of construction. So in, in some cases, we have um, mortgage-type financing, mm -hmm. and so there is a mortgage lender that's involved. But, I mean, that's, that's a process that I think everybody who, most people who own a house understand that relationship. Yep. Thank you. Assistant Mayor. Oh, do you want to give Vince's first yeah. read? Okay. Um, quick question that was covered, um, Adam, when you um, did your kind of talk with the Land Use Committee, and it's been brought up several times through, like, public dialogue, uh, is the, the consideration of PHA for um, reuse of other properties. Um, again, just touching on kind of the charrette that was done years ago with potentially the redevelopment of Gosling Meadows. And um, I ask this because it's, it's a legit concern that has come up several times from the public of um, should we be building more here or should we be building more on um, already managed land that PHA is operating housing on? Uh, so I guess just a quick, um, uh, a quick rundown on on what that potentially would look like and kind of, I guess, what you touched on at land use. I think it, it would be good for general public to right. touch on. I, I think it's important to understand that, that we're not saying that there are properties that we should not build on um, necessarily because um, 
we see the, the overall need as so large that it's, if we're going to solve this problem in our community, it's going to take more than one development. We have to look at the priority and the ability of our organization to do as much good as possible with the next project and then the next project. And so that gives us a sort of ranking um, that we do look at our own properties. And as, as you mentioned, we did have a charrette on the Gosling property. One of the things that we have to keep in mind is that if we're developing our own properties, we might temporarily have to displace uh, residents of those properties. And so we have to consider the impact to those residents who will be moved out of their homes if something like that happens. I think that's, that's such an important impact that that generally places some of those properties a little bit lower in the ranking um, than properties that don't have people living on them already. And I would add, that's a, that's a federal process that was recently, fairly recently created called the RAD process. Dover Housing Authority has done that with some of their property. And in our, we have, you know, we look at all of our properties and see what that opportunity is for investment. What a RAD process is, is an opportunity to recapitalize Portsmouth Housing Authority properties with tax credits. And given the age of some of these and when these housing authorities were created, Bosnian Meadows, et cetera, it's a good thing to do, but again, we have the problem of how do we triage it, how do we keep people in housing at the time that we want to rebuild it. And so that's one of the challenges we face and continually work with and rank what our opportunities might be. The reason this one excited us obviously is, you know, you're not dealing with some of those some of those challenges you face with a rad recapitalization process of existing housing authority housing buildings. Thank you. Council Lombardi. Uh, my question was close to what the assistant mayor was asking, but just what is, well, the Sherman property seems to have floated to the top. And um, there are other properties, and I know you looked at them. Um, can you just discuss a little bit about um, how that process happened and how Sherman floated to the top? from your opinion? I don't, I'm not sure that it was just our process. Well, no, no, um, I know it wasn't. But. Correct. Um, we're a housing entity that builds housing. Yeah. We are not a site selection committee for a city. And I understand the comments about the land use uh, committee, and I, I hear them. From our perspective, we look at where can we build the most effective project the soonest with the best impact on the community. And that ranking um, is pretty apparent about this, and it's hard to disagree with that. That does not mean that there aren't other good sites. It does not mean we look at them all, but this is one where we saw at the time and have given our report about an opportunity for a result. That said, we anticipate public process. and. Political leadership's going to do what political leadership does. We're here with the resource that we're able to commit to the process if we end up in the process. Councilor Cook. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, on that, I have a follow-up to um, Councilor Lombardi's question. Um, the lower lot here at City Hall has been identified as a potential location. It was one of those four sites. Um, this is my neighborhood. I'm eagerly I like to see more housing here. Um, so. If you were to do um, this project, say that you, um, because you've already done a lot of prep work to examine Sherburn, say you were to do it first, how long would it take to also do the lower lot? How many years does that take between projects? Well, I don't know that one and the other are mutually exclusive. What I can tell you is that Ruth Lewin Griffin Place took what our organization could do besides just actually running the properties that we have and, and uh, especially done during COVID and with a lot of challenges. So would we, would we look at a property of that nature? Sure, um, but I'll say back, we're in the world of public process. We're in the world of things that we don't control. Um, we're not pushing to have a project somewhere. We are going where the city feels it's appropriate and we can commit resources and answer the questions and try to do the job. And if we can't, somebody else can. Hmm. So, the, so the answer is, because I'm not sure if you're saying, you, you know, if that lower lot were immediately on the table, would it be something we would look at and commit funds to? The answer is maybe, but we can only handle so much. We're, you know, you see what our size and heft is. We're not, 
you know, and so we would we would be interested in looking at it. But I would respectfully suggest, as an as a recovering politician, that um, you know, you might have some public process on your hands if you're starting to look at at that lot, and rightfully so. Right. Yeah. Right. Um. Councilor Tabor. Um, <laughs> question of one of the things I did my first year as a councilor was uh, go visit with uh, Craig Welsh all of the housing properties and get a sense for the mission of the organization. Um, and maybe I think it would be helpful, first of all, if no one's ever done that, to, to go see how this organization is providing housing for people who otherwise could not afford it um, and the vital role that you fill for 1,200 units, uh, not a small amount of housing. Could you clarify your mission your, and what it means as a nonprofit, um, you know, how you use any proceeds that you get, um, and, and, and what, how, how, what's your mission and how, how do you work as a nonprofit? Well, I mean, we are a nonprofit that is originally chartered by HUD as a housing authority to provide low-income housing. There are criteria that we must meet in order to do that. That may also mean that we provide Section 8 vouchers, opportunities for people to have places to live. The way the tax credit laws were written, it allows for an additional level of income for workforce housing. So you have low-income housing, that's one definition, and then workforce housing, which is another definition, not a statutory New Hampshire definition, but a, de a definition that you, you can have a higher income and live in a tax credit property because tax credit investors are empowered by the federal government to offer those vehicles. And our mission is to put people in housing where they can't afford to otherwise live, and it isn't going to change. We've done it for 70 years, and we'll keep doing it. Thanks. Can I add one thing to that, yeah. too? I mean, you know, we're, we're volunteers. Our, our boards are all volunteer boards. We're a nonprofit. And, uh, you know, for a lot of us, um, keeping – there's been a lot said tonight about the character of Portsmouth and the character of Portsmouth neighborhoods. And just speaking personally about where my heart is in doing this work, um, we want to provide housing that can keep – Portsmouth residents in Portsmouth. You know, the city has changed so much over recent years because of development, because of um, a construction of properties at the high end that has not been matched by construction of below market rate homes. And it changes the character of our city. It's very important to me that we do this work that can help address that issue. Thanks. Assistant Mayor. Thank you. Um, Thank you for saying that. It kind of leads into where I kind of want to loop back into. Uh, when we look at the report and we talk about uh, neighborhood context, um, you say in, in this report that you're thinking, you know, a three- to four-story building because of below grade. I just want to make sure that, um, or check, is PHA open to other aesthetic options? I think there's a huge concern, um, and rightfully so, and in my own heart, of of the scale and look of a project in this location. And so I think when, you know, when we originally had the conversation of up to 180 units and um, now up to, you know, four stories, I think a huge amount of concern is that there's this notion that we're committed to an aesthetic or the PHA or the development partner within this would be committed to um, a look that, that could feel unbecoming to the neighborhood. So I guess I just want to make sure that um, throughout, if this process goes forward, which I am in support of figuring out a way that we can make more affordable housing that feels beneficial not only to those who would live there but those who would reside near it, um, that making sure that as we go through the public process of this, of, of discussion, that PHA is open to um, different aesthetics besides just potentially a one um, building that is four stories, even though I understand the scales of economics and the money decisions behind those things? I, the, the short answer is, is yes. I mean, we have to design a project that looks good. And, you know, there are a lot of different constituencies that, that it's important to meet that goal for. Um, primary is the future residents of anything that we build that 
you know, these are folks that want to live in Portsmouth, that want to live um, in a dignified home in Portsmouth, and I think that that means careful consideration of the aesthetic context. Um, and if you're asking whether or not we hear the message that this has to be appropriate in the neighborhood, uh, absolutely we do, and th there should be nothing in um, in any documents that we presented that say that our thinking on that is closed. Thank you. And to add, the only the only restriction we really face is whatever the financial restriction and economy of scale restriction is. Councillor Dutton. Thank you. I have more of a general comment, and then I actually want to start the conversation on process, because I don't think we've had that conversation yet. Um, you had mentioned veterans, and one thing which I learned actually up here as a city councilor is that veterans are a higher percentage. Veterans in Portsmouth are living below the federal poverty line more than anywhere else in Rockingham County or in New Hampshire. So there's a definite need in Portsmouth within the veteran community for housing. Before the Sherburn um, forum that was held, um, I had sat and met with both of you and with Craig just in general to hear about the needs for veterans and housing. And one thing that came up then is on average, and this was Section 8 housing, which is not being considered at Sherburn schools the primary use, but there's between 48 and 50 veterans a month on the rolls waiting. So I just wanted to highlight that um, there's a definite need for housing which leads to something I've said numerous times before. Uh, Sherman School is not my first choice to be first, but I do think each one of these properties should be developed in one form or another for affordable housing because that need is there. And that then leads to process on which way we're going to go going forward. And I do, it makes sense for the Ports Housing Authority to be a partner moving forward, um, seeing your records so far. And likewise, I think it might make sense to actually put out an RFP for the other properties as well, see if anyone else is interested in those properties, because I don't think Portsmouth Housing Authority has the bandwidth to do more than one at a time. And if we do move forward um, with this site or a different site, I think it does make good sense at a minimum to have a Blue Ribbon Committee I know it's been talked about. Um, numerous members of the public spoke tonight, I think would be good picks. Obviously, it's in your purview, whether it be Mr. Eric Anderson, who's represented the community well over the years, or um, Nick, I want to butcher your last name. Is it Rustino? Rustino. Think about this. Rustino. <laughs> You're clearly a teacher. Yes. So, <laughs> um, but I do want to get the process moving forward part of the conversation going to see what people's thoughts are on it because I know we're under a tight timeline if we're going to take advantage or if the Portsmouth Housing Authority is going to take advantage of any uh, credits. So that's, um, it, it may have, I've been waiting to ask this question. So um, from a process standpoint as you outlined, the next step is on page nine is a resolution to proceed from city council. That could be in conjunction, as I understand it, with creating a public process. So if we came back at a future council meeting with a resolution to proceed with the public process around this, that would be short of the resolution of disposition creating the ground lease in the future and that could involve the community to create a plan, so to speak, um, that would then be the basis of a, a vote on disposition sometime in the future. Is that? Yes, Mayor, and I, I will just underline that a community engagement process is, is crucial to any involvement we want to have, and I'm sure it's true for you too, so. Thanks. Councilor Bagley. Yeah, thank you, Honor, and uh, thank you. Uh, to Councilor Denton also for starting to get us moving in a forward direction. Going back to technical questions, and this one I don't think can be answered here. Uh, some of the concern, uh, if a project was to move forward on this site, is what happens to the existing Sherburn School building? Um, 
clearly there's no plan for it at the moment. So my question is, uh, part of what makes this site desirable is that it's five acres. If the site was broken up into uh, multiple parcels, say two parcels, and one parcel is the active parcel where a project would go forward, and the second parcel is the parcel with the Sherburne School on it and was retained by the city, if, if the zoning, all the technical legal reasons allow for that, is that something you can come back to us with an answer for? Because then the city would retain development rights over the Sherburne School. Um, and that, that's really the prerogative of the city, but I will say that our analysis was based on the preservation of the building. And so our analysis does not include removing the building, nor would we advocate for that. Great, thank you. And I think, uh, so Councilor Cook, um, you're up next. In terms of like, you know, designing what's on the site, I just want to be clear, at least from my perspective, and I think I speak for, at least for um, Councilor Denton, in terms of like a process, like we're not going to design the building up here. Like that's not going to happen right now. So, you know, some of these questions, like I would love, like if this is something that could move forward, I think it would require us to have a plan at the next meeting of how that public engagement to create whatever it would be on the site would be fleshed out pretty much down to the T and maybe appointees, you know, on waiting in the wings. Um, and then two, like what the actual resolution would be from a, um, you know, uh, uh, a resolution to, to move forward that would limit it in terms of the obligation of the city uh, to be able to, you know, up until the point of disposition change its mind. So there's a lot that, that, that I'm sure there's great questions. I just don't want to get into the business of, you know, designing it without having more public input on the process. Councilor Cook. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I'm going to ask a question that's going to sound like the last one, just because I think I didn't phrase it the right way um, to get kind of the answer I was looking for. Um, how long does it take Portsmouth Housing Authority to build a project? So when would Portsmouth Housing Authority be available to build a second project or a third project? Well, it, it depends on the project mm -hmm. because some are big, some aren't as big. I mean, do you want to speak to that? I mean, I, I think we can build, we've given you timelines before, and there's one here that's more a little more oblique on purpose with the idea that people will be talking about it. But we, we you know, have a certain deadline by which we have to get tax credits or nothing happens. And so we have to do that. We have to spend some development costs up front with non-federalized money, which we're able to do. But in the end, we have to get that uh, award of tax credits in order for us to go forward. And it's a two-year to shovel in the ground process mm -hmm. is, is essentially how we're looking at it from the August 1st deadline, right? Yeah, the key but, milestone is August every year when the tax credits are awarded. And that's if we don't get them, there's not a project. And if we do, there's a project. And then from that, we have to have a certain amount of design and approval work, like um, you know, permits in hand, for instance, right. uh, before we can get those tax credits. So after that, then the process moves fairly quickly, except for construction, which is not that But quick. it's key because they ha we have to have pretty significant plans. If they're going to award these tax credits, which are a significant item from federal government, you know, we have to have the plans ready. And that, that, in fact, if you wanted to go back and look at it, or if any of us did, Ruth Lewin Griffin. Can you speak to place. the microphone? Yeah, I'm sorry. With Ruth, Ruth Lewin Griffin Place, that's the same process we went through. It's what we would do here. But it's about a two-year process, we think, to get a shovel in the ground. So in front of that tax credit date, we have to do a lot of work, engineering, planning, et cetera, which means you have to have public process. And then if you get somewhere, then you have to do all that. And then you have to apply for the tax credit. Okay. So my follow-on question then is, clearly then we are too late in the year for the August 1st tax credits oh, yeah. for this year. So the earliest you would be applying for tax credits mm -hmm. would be 2024 in August. That's right. So we have a process that is at least a year before we even get to that stage. Right. And a note on the, the earlier schedule, you know, earlier pace at which we moved, was we were considering that August deadline earlier, you know, that's no longer on the table, and so the process has slowed down for that reason. Okay. And so can I follow up one more time? Um, so if we hit that stage, 2024, are we, this this timeline essentially we have, um, 
being completing construction June 2026 maybe is is optimistic then that's that's designed around that August uh, 2024 tax credit deadline okay thank you a question that was uh, brought up um, and, and curious about is the do the tax credits apply um, equally if they were going to be some sort of uh, owner occupied vehicle that's that's a question that's come up it's come up tonight um, and it came up in in our recent housing study as a as an urgent need somebody raised that um, to our knowledge New Hampshire Housing Finance Authority um, has not does not have a mechanism for funding that type of project but uh, it's certainly on our agenda to learn more about that okay so but I, I don't think the existing tax credit program would fund a project that's owner occupied so now you're in the world of legislation <laughs> and how do you create different ownership interests look at states that have done it and maybe get it through the New Hampshire legislature um, uh, which might be an endeavor so you know we know we know, we know how to do this and that we would look at alternative ownership options if there were a way that we could figure out how to do it and keep it perpetually um, you know owned but again we're going to be coming up against that tax credit legislation no more questions uh, thank you both for coming out tonight I I uh, I want to I want to thank you for the volunteer work that you do on this. Um, it is a, it's difficult to, to do anything in the public eye, and it's sometimes difficult to do complex things. Um, I will say that I uh, had the opportunity to go to uh, Woodbury, um, and they, they put some, some new uh, manufactured homes there, and that was a co-op that existed um, that's owner, you know, the, the, the group came together. And it was great um, to see uh, that neighborhood come together in support of, of that process. I got to speak with Kathy Ireland, uh, got to correct the record with her that it was my brother that was in the back of her brother's truck throwing eggs on, on Meadow Road and, and not me. He was much older. Um, but it, the thing that I guess struck me from, from Kathy's standpoint is uh, that it was about the the character of Portsmouth's our people. It's it's not really our our buildings, and I hope that we can remember that as we we move forward, and hopefully, you know, pull together some some ideas with the community. That's a win win for for all of us, um, because I know that there is not a single person in this room that doesn't believe there's a need for affordable units. I think that rightly, uh, folks have felt that this is a process that hasn't included them. We're trying to include the folks at Panaway and Sherburne as much as as much as as possible um, and we're not going to move forward it you know there needs to be there needs to be a um, an earnesty in this there needs to be a belief that uh, you know in Portsmouth we're going to try to 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 create a place where our kids uh, can live um, and it's it's not going to just be taken over uh, by interests from outside and it's really frustrating I guess and I wasn't really going to get that emotional about it but my 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 focus and to be able to to push on this is somebody that that's grown up here and seen the changes that has happened in our city seen that it is unaffordable for most of the people that I've grown up with to be able to stay here and to be in a position to do something about it and not to do something about it is something that I really can't stand. So I know that this is really hard. I know that we're talking about our backyards. I know that we're talking about our neighbors and we're talking about the scariest thing of all and that's the unknown. And I am trying and we are trying incredibly hard to take away some of that unknown and to move forward collaboratively around an idea that you don't have to be rich to live in Portsmouth. And that's what I thank you two for coming up tonight and speaking to. I thank everyone for speaking passionately about what it is you want to see in this.
There's not a neighborhood in Portsmouth that wouldn't share that, and that's what makes Portsmouth great. And I just ask that as we move forward in this process, we are going to do so respectfully of one another to understand that there are needs that we need to meet in the city, and the only way that we're going to do so is together. So thank you, Tom. Thank you, Adam. I am going to take a short five-minute recess uh, for a bio break and, and let everybody um, move on with the rest of the agenda. But I thank you so much for coming, and I thank everyone for speaking. Thanks, Mayor. Thanks.
We're moving on. Okay. Item two on the agenda. <laughs> um, welcome back. Uh, we have uh, next on the agenda is public hearings and vote on ordinances and or resolutions. Public hearing, second reading of ordinance. Uh, public hearing, uh, second reading of ordinance amending chapter four, article one, food licensing and regulations, section four. Point 101 adoption of the FDA 2022 food code section 4.102 amendments additions deletions to food code section 4.103 adoption of specific parts HE-P 2300 as amended and section 4.107 terms of license I'd await a motion to pass second reading and schedule third and final reading at the July 10th 2023 City Council meeting um, so moved. Second. second and now we will hear a presentation <laughs> Uh, we have our health director and officer, Kim McNamara. And if you'll give me one moment, I'll pull up her brief presentation. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. You can go to the next slide when you're ready, Karen. You got it. Uh, so we are updating the food code, um, and the reasons are a few uh, important ones. One is just for housekeeping. Uh, there are changes in things like everywhere it says the year 2009, because we have the 2009 FDA food code currently, we have to change that to 2022 food code, because that's what we're um, hoping to update to. Um, we're updating some definitions, because life changes. Uh, example is, you know, we used to have tobacco as a definition, you know, in food service. But now we have vaping that has been created since 2009, and so the the language has changed to tobacco products. So a lot of the updates that you saw are really these simple housekeeping and definition updates. Um, there's also some reasons for uh, food waste reduction, um, so allergen updates. We need to adjust to the evolving food industry, um, and we have to cover manufactured foods, which is why we have parts of HEP 2300, the old state food code, or the former. It, it's still in existence, but we used to refer to that. Um, and we now have three food manufacturing facilities, and so we need to incorporate those as well. Um, so these revisions uh, and additions were all from the 2022 FDA food code and the state HEP 2300, and these updates are expected to have minimal impact on operations. The items that may require some action on the part of our food service industry are just a few, and so those are the highlights that I have here. Um, the person in charge uh, shall now be a certified food protection manager who's shown proficiency of food safety through passing a test. The nationally known test is serve safe, um, very common. However, there are other entities. It's generally, there can be self-study materials. You can attend a class, and then there's an exam. If you pass the, the exam, you get the, um, the certification. We've, uh, FDA has also added non-typhoidal salmonella as a reportable illness. Uh, also, all facilities are required to have written procedures to follow when responding to an illness um, event in the establishment to minimize the spread of contamination and the exposure of employees and customers. Also, um, sesame was added as the ninth major food allergen for la labeling purposes so people can be aware um, and remain safe when they're purchasing foods to consume. Also included in the updates, um, the term food donation was added to encourage operations to donate food and grocery products to nonprofits that serve people who are food insecure and also to reduce food waste. Um, pet dogs are now included and allowed on decks by the FDA food code. We were way ahead of that curb. Mm -hmm. This is now just codifying it under the food code instead of our own separate variants. And restaurants can still choose to, pan, to ban pet dogs, provided it doesn't conflict with legal requirements for reasonable accommodations concerning service dogs. Not everybody wants dogs on their decks, and that option is still fully uh, open to restaurants and food service facilities. Uh, and also, returning refillables is a new section, um, which allows facilities to refill contain containers, take out containers to reduce waste. Um, as long as they meet some basic um, requirements that they're cleanable and good repair, inspected, and, and they go through a dishwashing system so we know they're sanitized. Next, please. 
Uh, drain boards was a question that came up and it was probably the only question people really had about these changes from the restaurant industry. Uh, this section is being added to the food code not because we're going to make anybody that's currently existing put uh, change out a sink if it doesn't have dual drain boards. It really is to cover plan review which isn't spelled out in the food code so we have a lot of architects and designers and individual owners who don't understand that a uh, three bay sink needs integral brain drain boards on both sides. This just spells it out for them so it's not a secret that they find out after the plans have been submitted. Um, and then this is the one that has much to do with the manufactured foods. Essentially what this says is that the health department will treat as confidential any trade secrets we come upon during inspections or review of HACCP plans, things like secret ingredients, secret processes, um, secret recipes. We are required to keep that confidential, which we've always done anyhow, but it's now codified that, that we will keep that confidential. Second piece of this is also uh, industry standard, but you may not be aware that when we receive consumer complaints, we keep that information confidential too, unless by a court of law, if it gets that far, we are required to disclose it. Otherwise, people would be concerned about making complaints. We don't go in assuming complaints are valid. We go in when we receive one. Um, to look into the issue and see if there if there is anything to it. Um, so people shouldn't be concerned about this, but there is some consumer protection. And some of these complaints come with medical information we also have to be careful of. If someone has experienced an illness and we have their medical information. And if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Councilor Cook. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I actually just wanted to say thank you for including the returning refillables section. Um, I think that that goes a long way to um, our sustainability efforts. Thank you. And just a quick question um, when it came to the manufacturing. We don't have too many food manufacturers um, in Portsmouth. Is no, we have three. We have three. Five. I know we don't have many, so three. But yeah. uh, were they all engaged in this and aware of these changes? We um, they have been aware that we. Uh, permit them aside from Highliner Foods. Highliner Foods used to be regulated by the FDA that would come out. Um, they, we've been in discussions about taking them on in inspection, but we really needed this to be codified. Otherwise, we don't really have authority. So the other smaller food manufacturers have some retail processes that we can look at, but this really um, gives us the authority to do the full food manufacturers such as Highliner. Okay, so I guess another, I just want to, what I'm trying to see is if um, this were passed and the food, uh, um, I guess, uh, manufactures the smaller ones, would they be surprised of anything that's in uh, these updates? No. Okay, great. <clears throat> All right, now we have, uh, I think, thank you that it, for the, uh, the, the, the questions. We'll open up the public hearing. Any public hearing speakers that wish to rise here or on Zoom? Seeing none, I, oh, I'm gonna close the public hearing. Yeah. Do you, are you okay with that? I'm good with that. All right. Okay. Closing the public hearing, oh. Councillor Denton. Now, there was one active member of the public who was here to speak in favor, favor of yes. this for the uh, very reason which Councillor Cook brought up, which is the reusable potential of containers. And I know Christina has two young kids, and she stayed to the meeting until this point. So. It was she. She definitely shared. Uh, she was in favor. Of yes. That. So we we'll go on record that there was one public speaker. Uh, well, not I guess Kelly's record. Put the record in our hearts. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. Um, any additional uh, council questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Thank you so much. Kim. Thanks, Kim. We are on to the city manager. Yes, sir. First up is a request for first reading for the annual omnibus ordinance change as part of what parking and traffic safety committee's charge includes. And this year's changes are detailed in your packet. They address changes to one way streets, taxi cab stands, and speed limits. And uh, we would ask for uh, the council to move to schedule first reading at the July 10th council meeting. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. 
The second request is for more action to take place at the next meeting. It's for a public hearing regarding various bonding resolutions for projects to begin in FY24. And before you tonight is consideration of a total of five different requests. Those are in five different funds. Uh, sorry, one, uh, two are within the general fund, one for various city projects, one for school, and then separate uh, with the parking, water, and sewer funds. And um, I would mention that there was some confusion about uh, how we bond and how we spend, and, and, and there's not necessarily a tie. The, the spending of the bond funds depends on the project schedule, and I wanted to address that. I also wanted to mention that um, there was a question about the use of ESSER funds, and the reason uh, in, in regard to the school request, the elementary school facilities will be taking advantage of 1.5 million in ESSER funds, thereby making 1.5 movable to the Lister Academy project. So, and, and we need to call that out as part of the bond issuance. So we want to make sure people understood that. And lastly, um, as it relates to the parking request, the space to be dedicated to uh, office space is not space that could be used for parking um, as part of the construction of the garage. So just want to answer all those questions. So the request would be to hold all these public hearings and resolutions on July 10th. I'd wait a motion to authorize the city manager to bring back for public hearing and adoption the various proposed CIP projects to be bonded as presented for the July 10th, 2023 City Council meeting. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Item number three is a right of way easement deed for property located at the intersection of Sagamore Grove and Sagamore Avenue, the new construction six unit residential building. Uh, it was granted site plan approval back in January of 2022 by the planning board. Subsequent to the approval, city staff identified that the existing right-of-way as articulated in the deed does not include approximately 124 square feet of the new proposed roadway. Therefore, on June 16th, the Planning Board took a second vote to recommend to the City Council that the Council accept a right-of-way easement incorporating this additional section of proposed roadway into the City's existing right-of-way known as Sagamore Grove, and the easement deed is in your packet along with a drawing. Both Public Works and Planning recommend acceptance of this section of right-of-way, and legal has reviewed this to form. I'd wait a motion uh, to authorize the City Manager to accept and record a right-of-way easement deed in substantial uh, or substantially similar form to the easement deed from Sagamore Corner LLC contained in the agenda packet. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. The last request is somewhat complicated, but how it breaks down is this. There are three distinct requests of you tonight. Uh, there is recognition of two grant agreements that the staff was able to obtain, along with a request to establish a public hearing date for a supplemental appropriation should we need one. And I should mention, even though he wants to remain anonymous, he won't anymore. Al Pratt, our water resource manager, is here. He will make the brief presentation at the July 10th meeting, if you so deem it appropriate. Uh, but long story short, uh, we have we will benefit from two grants. The total appraisal on this parcel of land, uh, which is 45 acres abutting the, the Bellamy Reservoir, which is our main water source, uh, the value of the easement has been determined to be 1.435 million, of which we've obtained uh, 739,000 from one grant and 25 from another. We're seeking an appropriation through Senator Shaheen's office for 714000 and if that does come through, we will not need any city money, but in the event it does not, we would look to backstop that with approval of a supplemental appropriation from our water fund. And as the grants function anyway, the grants are reimbursable, so we need to put forth the money up front and then um, put the, the monies received in our water fund. So sorry for the long-winded uh, request, but there are three separate motions tonight. Okay, and so... Um, <coughs> I'd wait a motion uh, to authorize the city manager to enter into a grant agreement to accept up to $739,000 from the state of New Hampshire's Drinking Water and Groundwater Trust Fund Lands Conservation Grant and Loan Program to be used towards this purchase. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And. Uh, I'd wait a motion to authorize the city manager to enter into a grant agreement to accept up to 25000 from the state of New Hampshire's Department of Environmental Services local source water protection program to be used towards this purchase. So moved. Second. Any discussion? 
All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And I'd wait a motion to establish a public hearing July 10th, 2023 for a supplemental appropriation of $1.478,000 or $1,478,000 from the Water Enterprise Fund using a grant of up to $739,000 from the New Hampshire Drinking Water and Groundwater Trust Fund, a grant of up to $25,000 from New Hampshire DES Local Source Water Protection Program and the remaining 714,000 from the net position with the understanding that city staff will pursue additional funding via U.S. Senator Shaheen's congressionally directed funding request to the FY 2024 Interior Environmental and Related Agencies Appropriation Bill. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you, Al. Thank you, Al. Thank you, Al. Thanks, Al. Good night. See you next, see you next meeting. <coughs> it's good since we already signed the purchase and sale. <laughs> so we're up with the consent agenda. Um, I'd uh, wait a motion to adopt the consent agenda. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Um, Next up, um, we have the uh, presentations, written communications um, that has, uh, we, we, we went I'm through not. A, we're at B, I'd wait, uh, email correspondence. I'd wait a motion to accept and place on file. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? We have a letter from Tina Sautel, the music hall requesting permission for the closure of Chestnut Street on Saturday, July 8th, 2023 for Dan Brown's Wild Symphony. I had wait a motion to refer to the city manager with the authority to act. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> Uh, next up, a letter from Alan Schultz, uh, Portsmouth Professional Firefighters Local 1313, requesting permission to hold a charity pickleball tournament at the community campus on Saturday, September 16th, 2023, from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. I'd wait a motion to refer to the city manager with the authority to act. So, so moved. moved. Second. Any discussion? Your Honor. Sounds exciting. I, Councilor I just, Bagley. I think it's a, you know, the fire department's a doing this this charity fundraiser for a long time and i think this might be a pivot from the boot drive to showcasing the brand new pickle ball courts off of community campus so i think that's a great initiative all right yeah because i was going to say they couldn't have been doing a pickleball tournament for a long time because pickleball sprung up on us just a couple years ago um but look forward to that uh i'd wait a sample motion to remove oh, we've got the sample motion all in favor aye. aye any opposed good luck hopefully the knees hold up um uh, we have a letter from Mark Lefebvre, Pine Tree Institute, uh, requesting permission to deliver services uh, within the city at designated parking space for two hours per week. Uh, I'd wait a sample motion to refer to the city manager with authority to act. So moved. Second. Any questions on this? Councilor Cook. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. I just wanted to know if this is something that we've done in the past, um, if we've had anyone provide uh, services from a vehicle within the city? Not that I'm familiar with, but since uh, our health officer director is still here, um, I'd, I'd give her an opportunity to, to chime in. If that's okay with you, Mayor. Quite all right. Nice to see you again, Kim. We haven't, we've known the need has existed for quite a while and there've been uh, past discussions, but now there is a fully available van with stocked with supplies run by an organization that is willing to do this. Great. Uh, follow up? Yes, just one quick follow up. I know that there are other organizations that also provide services like mobile mammogram services. And um, will we be kind of open to considering, I guess, other services as well in the future if they're, we de deem that they're needed in the community and we don't have that? Well, that wouldn't be my decision to make, but sounds great. <laughs> ah, okay. Thank you. So I uh, just, I think with. Um, Moving this to the city manager with authority to act, uh, we would expect the weight of this decision to be taken into context with other organizations that might want to take up and a trust in the judgment to make a plan that would be repeatable if that was so deemed. Councilor Bagley. Yeah, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, from reading the letter and the information in the packet, it sounds like they're looking for a parking space somewhere in the city, not necessarily a, 
uh, metered parking Monetized space somewhere in the city. Yeah. And I think it's worth making that distinction because we're not talking about giving away a monetized parking space. We're talking about a parking space that would otherwise be non-monetized. Any other discussion? Thank you very much, Kim. Thanks, Kim. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. On to council agenda. Uh, have an appointment to be considered of James Hewitt to the Safe Water Advisory Group. Um, I would ask that any uh, thoughts or, uh, or as always, um, to be shared uh, before the next meeting uh, on this, either um, email or come talk to me. Um, but the appointments to be voted. Uh, we have um, appointment of Linnea Grimm to the Arts and Nonprofit Committee, President and CEO of Strawberry Bank Museum Representative, reappointment of Jessica Blasco to the Conservation Committee, the appointment of Adam Fitzpatrick to the Conservation Committee, the reappointment of Abigail Jindel, Barbara McMillan, uh, Allison Tanner, and Lynn Vaccaro, uh, all to the Conservation uh, Commission, and the appointment of Linnea Grimm to the Prescott Park Master Plan Implementation Blue Ribbon Committee. Uh, I'd wait a motion to approve these appointments as presented. So moved. Second. Your Honor, um, I believe one of the appointees is as an alternate. I don't know if that needs to be. Made. Oh, yes. Uh, Abigail Jindel to the Conservation Commission as an alternate. Sorry, I didn't read that. Hopefully, Kelly, you got that. I have that. Okay. <laughs> all right. It's on the agenda. I can only. You're good. Uh, all right. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, again, thank you all for willing to serve Portsmouth. Um, next up, Councilor Moreau. Um, I will be hopefully pretty quick. Um, uh, you guys were presented with um, the artist that was chosen to do the sculpture in the Behenko Gateway Park. And so what I have left and what was in your packet, I know it probably looks a little strange, but um, I'm going <laughs> to read something that comes from the committee to give you some more, an overview of the process and how we've got to this. So the paper cut design for Portsmouth, New Hampshire 400's anniversary was created through a month-long community engagement program that took place both online and on-site. Members of the community actively participated by submitting their perspectives, images, and paper cut designs related to the city's maritime culture. Working with the PNH 400 committee, the selected content represents the collective voices and experiences of the community. This inclusive approach ensures that the design becomes a true tribute to Portsmouth 400 year maritime history. It celebrates the community's sharing her shared heritage, fostering pride and, and ownership. The paper cut design serves as a visual representation of Portsmouth identity and spirit, showcasing the vibrant connections between the city and its maritime culture. You will find <clears throat> these images in the design, a canoe representing indigenous people, white pines, which represents ship masts, the start of shipbuilding in the area, codfish to, for the commercial fishing, clipper ship, albacore submarine, lighthouse, the Scatical River, seagulls, strawberry, eelgrass, sailor's knots, friends and loved ones waiting for those at sea. There's two children in one of them. The design has been approved by the city PNH 400 leadership and members of the legacy subcommittee, including the review team. Response has been overwhelmingly positive, and the only suggestion to date had been to tighten the sailor's knot at the top of the sail to make it more recognizable. I know that there was a request by Councillor Bagley when we first, um, you know, approved this that you guys wanted some input in the design and how it moved forward. So this is basically the the design cutouts that will be into the two metal structures that um, will be put together. If you guys have any comments or feedback, I'd be happy to give it to the committee. Oh, I, I yeah. feel like maybe I should comment. This is amazing. <laughs> I think this is uh, going to be a great piece of art in Portsmouth, and it doesn't just look good, but it has a lot of uh, meaning behind all of the iconography. A lot of thought went into it, that's for sure, and a lot of input. Thank you very much, Councilor Murrow. Appreciate that, and uh, our thanks to the committee uh, as well as the artist. Uh, next up, Councilor Bagley. All right, thank you, Your Honor. I've got a number of items tonight. Uh, first is Parking Traffic and Safety Committee Action Sheet and Minutes of June 1st, 2023. Uh, I move to accept and approve the Action Sheet and Minutes of June 1st, 2023, Parking Traffic and Safety Committee. And if I get a second, I'll speak to it. Second. Uh, so this was a meeting where we talked quite a bit about the I actually wasn't there, uh, but Councilor Moreau was there. Um, the roundabout, the mini roundabout, I would say people either really love it or generally 
don't like it at all uh, was kind of the consensus, but it seemed to be split down the middle. Middle, so we're evaluating it for another 30 days before we have to move forward with either that design or alternative design, which we'll discuss at the July meeting. The other uh, big detail was the two-way traffic report for State Street. The long and short of it is it's feasible from a traffic standpoint, um, but it's not really doesn't really have any benefits over the current configuration. Um, but there might be non-traffic moving benefits, such as safer for pedestrians, more activated streets, uh, slower traffic speeds, which is just generally safer. So it's something we'll continue to look at, but uh, there was no, I guess, red flags from that presentation. And then there was one other thing. Oh yeah, we uh, lowered some speed limits to 25 miles an hour on Islington Street and Middle Road, and we voted to make those permanent. Uh, they used to be 30, uh, or 35 miles per hour. So we're doing what we can to uh, calm traffic in the city. Councilor Bagley, any further discussion? Councilor Moreau. Um, I would have to say in listening to the people speak about the roundabout, it seemed like everyone that lived really close to it loves it and everyone who just drives through it hates it. So that's really where things tend to split down on it. <laughs> so it was split, but it was really split to, you know, whether or not you lived really close to it or not. Um, on the State Street, if I, if I might, I was actually incredibly encouraged because one of the hopes in doing this was to actually lower the speed and this proved it does lower the speed. It also does remove and make the intersections on um, Congress through Market Square actually less trafficy, which was also one of the kind of goals of doing this. Um, and we only would lose up to one to two parking spots, and that's because they suggest at the end of State Street getting on to Middle uh, that they put a right turning lane, and that would be the only reason. And they did a really ballpark estimate that it could cost around a million dollars to change the two medians and the two lights. So. In the end, it's totally doable, and I think we should really consider what our next steps would be to move forward, whether or not we would need to get feedback from the state and how that process would work. I guess I would be curious, since it's a state road, it's like people forget, like the bypass That's why is I said bypassing <laughs> Route 1, which goes through the middle of our downtown right. um, in two parts. So I think a, um, it would be interested to see if there was a state feedback on that or if that came up at the PTS meeting to it, request? It did not. Okay. So this was just a presentation. So yeah. if we approve the minutes, we're not approving anything yeah, other yeah, than yeah. But I think that would be my next request back to PTS is to then say how do we move forward on the state level and what do we need to do, what steps do we need to take to get their feedback as well. System Mayor. Thank you. Uh, I have a couple questions on the action items. Um, so it looks in here to raise the boot and tow fee from 125 to 250. We are going to get to that specifically, I believe, under my third agenda item. Okay. So we're only in number one. Okay. Jump in the gun here. <laughs> Just know I have some questions. I, yeah, so, okay, but that is, so it is. But it's it, in the It's, it's oh, in the minutes. minutes, but it's separate as a, as a separate action So item. there's been a lot of confusion on this. Yeah. Um, right now, if you have $150 in outstanding tickets, the city is permitted to either boot your car or tow your car to get you to pay those tickets. With the increase of parking ticket prices several years ago, you get to 150 with three tickets potentially, which is a little unfair. So what we did is we raised that threshold, or if we vote tonight, to $250 so you could get a, you know five or six tickets before you're looking at a, a boot fee or a towing fee. So it's it's more forgiving if we raise that. And if I can just add procedurally, that's not an item that's subject to omnibus. That's why it's being pulled out as a separate vote on this tonight item. But that came up in the PTS meeting because people thought we were fining a higher amount. This isn't money that goes to the city. This no is limit. just how much outstanding fines you can have before we take an enforcement action. Okay. okay. And it's not in the minutes or it's not in the it has to be separately approved because it is a it's not a subject to the omnibus uh, which only exists for uh, safety measures and not uh, fee changes okay any other questions on the first of Councilor Bagley's three items all in favor aye, aye. any opposed
All right, second, uh, request for first reading regarding amendment to chapter seven, article six equals loading zone, section 7.601, limited hours loading zone, sample motion move to schedule first reading of chapter seven, article six, loading zone, section 7.601, limited hours loading zones at the July 10th, 2023 City Council meeting. Uh, and if I get a second, I'll speak to it. Second. Uh, this is, we uh, instituted availability for paid parking in the loading zones after they're not really utilized as loading zones anymore. And this is great for two reasons. One, it generates additional revenue for the city, but far more importantly, only, pretty much only locals know that this is a thing that you can do. So uh, if you're local to the area, you might be able to find a, a prime parking spot downtown at the busiest times because <laughs> if you're not local, you don't think to park in a loading zone. Just remember you have to pay when you park there. You used to not have to. <laughs> and that's just to schedule the public hearing, I think, for the next meeting. Correct. Any discussion on the request for first reading? Mrs. Um, it looks like in the amendments, red lined is number three, Bridge Street, westerly side, beginning 50 feet. So are we removing that loading zone? Or is it just? I'm going to have to get, there's like 18 of them. Okay. We can make that part of the presentation. Yeah. So just, I there's, think just, there's just some of them that are red lined here. And so I guess I would just like to understand completely why they're red lined. There might be some additional tweaks before the the okay. hearing at the next meeting too because i think there's a couple uh clerical errors but i don't recall exactly what they were so i wasn't going to try and address them tonight okay yeah if we can just get some clarification on some of the there there's specifically um three and eight are um zones that are just completely crossed out so if we can just get clarification on that and we did i believe if i recall we actually got rid of some loaded loading zones because they weren't being used at all and there were some loading zones that we don't we're open up to parking because they're used right. continuously. So we, we, this isn't just us changing things. It was a big, long study and evaluation of each loading zone. No, totally understand. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And then lastly, um, a PTS action item from June 1st, 2023 meeting also includes an amendment to Chapter 7, Article 10, towing section 7.1004 that increases the amount of outstanding fines that trigger the boot and tow penalty from 150 to $250. So I'm requesting a first reading regarding amendment to chapter seven, article 10 towing section one, section 7.1004 towing or immobilization of motor vehicles for non-payment of parking fines. And I move to schedule first reading of chapter seven, article 10 towing Section 7.1004, towing or immobilization of motor vehicles for non-payment of parking fines at the July 10th, 2023 City Council meeting. Second. And uh, as we discussed earlier, this is not money that the city is collecting. This is just raising the threshold before you trigger enforcement action. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Would love to see in that first reading if we only get to that uh, first reading for that to be as clear as possible that this is not an increase in fines but a uh, an increase in threshold for when uh, enforcement action could be taken. All right, Councillor Cook, you're up. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I move to request first reading at the July 10th, 2023 City Council meeting of changes proposed by the Governance Committee to our Administrative Ordinance Chapter 1, Articles 3 and 4. Um, and if I get a second, I'll speak to that. Second. Thank you. Um, the Governance Committee is moving forward these changes to the Administrative Ordinance. And really, all these changes do are bring our um, the language um, up to date um, with regard to gender and also address uh, the issue of expectations that we have in the city that chairs are appointed annually in January, and that is uniformly pretty much done across committees, but it's not in our ordinance. So we wanna make sure that that's clear. Currently the ordinance, um, some committees specify, others don't. Um, so we just, we're trying to clean up the ordinance and make it clear on appointment of chair.
Excellent. Councilman, <laughs> Councilman Moreau, what's up? <laughs> uh, no, I'm just, I, well, I'm thinking because you talk a lot about when they vote in chairs. Well, some boards end at different times. So if terms are ending on December 1st versus December 31st, then what do you do for that month if the chair's terming off? Hmm. <laughs> just because I know that happens at the Zoning Board of Adjustment, right? They tend to vote on a chair in December for January, yet planning board votes on one in January for January. I, I, I'm all for making it all the same, but I just want to make sure that we're not going to have, you know, a chair terming off and then a month where there isn't a, a chair. That's all. Um, I think that, you know, generally they can elect, it doesn't prohibit them from electing a chair at any time. We just want to make sure that committees are consistently electing a chair once a year. And by giving them that January date, first meeting in January, even if you elected your chair in December, you can revote January at your first meeting. I think the goal is though to make sure everyone is doing that on a regular basis, um, which we think is really happening already, but we just want to make sure we're consistent across the, the city. Okay. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you, Councillor Cook. Next up, approval of grants and donations. Acceptance of lead service line sampling plan and replacement plan grant <coughs> program for Portsmouth Waterworks and Peace Trade Port in the amount of $75,000. I'd wait a motion to authorize the city manager to enter into a grant agreement with the State of New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services to accept up to $75,000 from the lead service line sampling plan and replacement plan grant program. This funding will be used for data mining and for development of a service line inventory in Portsmouth that will meet the regulatory requirements associated with the EPA revised lead copper rule. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Councillor Bagley. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Just quickly on this, uh, we saw with uh, the uh, health needs assessment presentation that <coughs> lead testing is down considerably since COVID. Um, Lead, uh, because of the, the age of our water lines and because of the number of older houses with lead paint, uh, when you're up lowering raising windows, especially for our youngest population, is, is still a hazard. So um, I'm glad to see this grant, and I think we'll probably be bringing some more things forward addressing this specific uh, health and safety issue because with lead poisoning, uh, if it were to happen, uh, those individuals typically will need services uh, for the rest of their lives, and that's, uh, of course, terrible for those individuals and it's a much more expensive way to uh, deal with things rather than mitigating the problem at its source. Any other discussion? Councilor Bagley? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Next up, the acceptance of grant from Homeland Security for the Police Department in the amount of $31,819.70. We wait a motion to approve and accept the grant as presented. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Next is the accept, uh, acceptance of Victims of Crime Act uh, or VOCA grant for the police department in the amount of $24,759. Await a motion to approve and accept the grant as presented. So moved. Mm -hmm. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 And on to the city manager's informational items. There's one more. There's one more. Oh. Letter D. Oh. <laughs> I didn't see any the dollar price. signs. I just, <laughs> that's, I just was looking for dollar signs. And except we see the acceptance of donation for the police department of various in-kind items. I'd wait a motion to approve and accept the donations as presented. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Jai Jobs. Your Honor, I have two really quick updates. Uh, apparently I have more than two. Hold on, I can't even add. Um, first on flash vote. <laughs> Uh, we are excited to be rolling out the first survey tomorrow uh, and as you will recall uh, to have a statistically valid sample we needed at least 600 residents we're pleased to report we have o almost 700 residents signed up there's still time to sign up you can sign up at any time even if you don't sign up in time for this first survey the details are on our website and our, in our weekly newsletter and the first survey will focus on high-level community priorities it'll be five questions it should take you about three minutes to answer and then within 48 hours, uh, the survey will close and we'll have the results automatically, which we'll share with the public. So if you haven't signed up, you can sign up tomorrow or the day after and do the survey. You got it. Okay. 
can sign and up after the, the survey. Just go to you can ex sign up after, but you don't get to right. do the survey. You're always the first survey. If you uh, the, the the website is portsnh.co forward slash flash vote, and again that's on our website and in our newsletter. The second update is a positive update, and this relates to the work going on at 147 Congress Street, uh, tied in with the temporary construction license. There were um, concerns about pedestrians ignoring signs and crossing at the intersection when there was no sidewalk to cross to. So staff and the owner immediately agreed to open up the sidewalk at the corner in order to provide refuge. And since that time, um, the sidewalk on the Congress Street side is completely open and uh, the crosswalk will be maintained for public safety. We will continue to monitor that area and the uh, owner is being very cooperative with us. Third item relates to activity at Prescott Park and um, what we are concerned about is the use of the fence and city property in that area. So in a sense we are taking back the fence. Uh, this may not meet with, uh, with great um, excitement from many people but we're going to remove the locks from the fence. Oh, no. We periodically remove them anyway. Um, it has weight significance to the fence. Uh, in addition, we will remove any signage that would include a bunting flags, anything else that might be affixed to municipal property uh, because we want to make sure that is a consistently maintained area. So that is my third info item. And the fourth info item relates to the last Peace Development Authority board meeting. And there were uh, six quick updates. First, the Aviation Avenue Group LLC, which was looking to site an advanced manufacturer. Uh, at uh, 100 New Hampshire Avenue is pivoting to uh, bringing in a logistics company for a national, fur national furniture manufacturer and retailer given that the, evapor um, the demand for advanced manufacturing has essentially evaporated in, literally in the last three to four months. So the good news is they've got a new user. Uh, there has been an extension of the project known as Millionaire to the end of this calendar year. There were two uh, concept approvals for both for ambulatory surgical centers, interestingly, one at the old Shane's and McEachern building and one at 360 Corporate Drive known as the old Officers Club. Uh, we approved the operation and maintenance budget for FY24, which includes an increase of 2.7% in wages. Just thinking about how that compares to our budget. And lastly, uh, the golf course is grateful for the work that our water department has done because there will be a water filling station between holes six and seven. Hmm. That is the P's update, and I'm going to front course or the or the blue course. Yeah. Front, um, front I think nine? it's the front nine. Uh -huh. right. um, and if I can walk on an item number five, and it would might be a good segue to miscellaneous, uh, the council should know and the public should know we signed the contract. I signed it with CLA last week. Uh, we've had pro mm. several preliminary meetings. They'll be on site in July, and staff is ready to go. Great. That was a question. Um, we have, so it's, we're, we're done, but we have miscellaneous. All right. Count, six uh, minutes. Councilor Moreau. Yeah, we got six minutes, guys. <laughs> I just want to know if there's any appetite, since we didn't really have many people from the public come and speak regarding our updating of the food service law, whether or not we should suspend the rules and bring forward third and final reading, since we do have a lot of other things coming for our July 10th meeting. I think um, that's appropriate. appropriate? Uh, I'd wait a motion to suspend the rules. Kelly, can we do that now? Sure. Yeah. Okay. We'd so moved. Second. Um, well, we have to uh, suspend the rules. I'd wait a motion to suspend the rules and uh, bring forth third and final reading of the food code updates. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That's great. Thank you. And then we have to actually do the third reading. Yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. How do I do this? So we just here. need a motion for to. All right, I'd wait a motion to pass third and final reading of the food code updates. Yes. So, so moved. moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Great yeah. job. Thanks, <laughs> Councilor Lombardi. All right, just informational. Um, there'll be a public information session uh, by the uh, mayor's blue ribbon. Committee on uh, Historical Archives. Okay. It will be uh, 6.30 on J June 28th, that's next Wednesday, in the Levinson Room. Um, we're expecting to have a good number of people there. Uh, we've, the, the group has been meeting and we've met with two archivists um, who've donated a lot of time to us and uh, we're, we're just moving forward with the program. So. Uh, our intention is to get uh, more uh, general input from uh, the residents of Portsmouth. 
Thank you, Councilman Barton. And that's June 28th? 28th, 6.30 at the Levinson Room. Excellent. Councilor Cook. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. I just wanted to give a quick update um, on the cultural planning process for this city. Um, we have a consultant uh, in place. We expect to have initial meetings in July, and we expect that process to take about six months. So we anticipate having a new cultural plan for the city by the end of the year, hopefully. Awesome. Councilor Bagley. A quick one, um, but it ties into the fact that it's almost 1030 at night. Um, I just want to thank Steve and Bob from the Department of Public Works because they uh, let Monty Bohannon, who's still here this late at night, uh, shadow them at 7 o'clock this morning and see some of the important work they do for the city. Excellent. Thank you, guys. Any other miscellaneous items? With that, I'd wait a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Good night, Portsmouth. <laughs>